Pennsylvania Cancer Society um, and the um, Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, in as they are uh, uh, major supporters of this program, uh, were asked to deliver a presentation that was developed uh, on their uh, uh, on their behalf. Fantastic. Okay. So what is colorectal cancer? Well, colorectal cancer is a cancer that forms uh, in the colon or the rectum. This is the, also referred to as the, the large intestine. Um, and what's important to know is that colon cancer is uh, preventable and uh, treatable and curable, uh, particularly when it is identified in its precancer phase or in its early stages. Well, where is the colon found? The, uh, this is a, a pictorial of the entire digestive tract. As gastroenterologists, we, uh, we really are doctors uh, from stem to stern and, and everything in the middle. And um, you know, if you follow food that enters the digestive tract, it comes through the esophagus, it enters into the stomach here, uh, where digestion has begun. It enters into the small intestine, where it's mixed with juices from the pancreas and from the liver to aid in digestion and absorption. <laughs> And then it takes a circuitous path through the many uh, feet of small intestine and ultimately is delivered to the colon, uh, which is this large structure that extends from the right lower quadrant up to the right upper quadrant, across the abdomen to the left upper quadrant, and down, and with its exodus uh, uh, at the anal canal. So colorectal cancer are cancers that arise anywhere along the entire colon and the rectum itself. We, we distinguish colon and rectal cancers because there are some variations in uh, anatomic features in the rectum and the biologic behavior of tumors there that merit uh, that discrimination. Now, colon cancer is a common cancer. In the United States, it's the third most common cause of cancer in both men and women. Um, it uh, accounts for greater than 8,000 cases uh, in Pennsylvania each year. And you can see that it's an equal opportunity offender, offending both uh, men and women, people of all socioeconomic class, and um, uh, all ethnicities. Now, while it's the third leading cause of cancer, it's the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in Pennsylvania. So this emphasizes the lethality of colon cancer when it's detected uh, in its later stages and accounts for almost 3,000 deaths related to colon cancer in Pennsylvania each year. So it's a major health problem. The question is, you know, who is at risk for colorectal cancer? Well, the reality is we're all at risk for colorectal cancer. We recognize that age plays a role, so age greater than 50 is a, a increased risk. There are certain um, uh, familial factors that uh, identify or allow us to identify patients who may be at increased risk at younger age, and our speakers are going to uh, refer to that today. Again, while an equal opportunity offender, we recognize that African Americans are afflicted at uh, a higher rate and at a slightly uh, younger age than uh, Caucasians in the United States. Uh, gender uh, is, has a, a, an influence. Again, it afflicts both men and women, but men are at slightly higher risk compared to women. Family history of polyps and cancer is really substantial, and that's why uh, I like to think of colon cancer prevention as a true family affair. And this is an opportunity for, for you to stay in touch with your brothers and sisters and your children and your uh, nieces and nephews and mothers and fathers. I think. One of the, uh, 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 a campaign that I've um, been trying to uh, generate some traction for is for, for college age uh, kids to go back at, at spring break and winter break and summer break and remind their parents and their grandparents to uh, ensure that they're getting their colorectal cancer screening done. A little payback for all that tuition in my mind. Now all the items on the right side really apply to efforts that one can embrace to lower their overall cancer and general health risk. Um, we, there is epidemiologic data that supports that uh, individuals who've over a lifetime consumed a high fat diet, a diet that's low in fiber intake, uh, use of uh, alcohol and tobacco, 
sedentary lifestyle all contribute to increased risk of, of all types of cancer and cancer mortality. And these are the conditions that create the environment uh, within our digestive tract that can promote uh, cancer growth or prevent uh, cancer growth from occurring. There are, all of these uh, then contribute to genetic changes or genetic mutations that are the uh, foundation upon which precancer lesions arise and cancer develops. There are several um, unique circumstances that promote chronic inflammation in the colon that is associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. These are uh, fall into the category of inflammatory bowel disease and specifically ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And so patients are usually under the care of a gastroenterologist when they have these conditions and they are, uh, because of their increased risk, recommended for a more intensive screening and surveillance program than otherwise average risk individuals and individuals with family history or a personal history of uh, polyps or cancer. And then very specifically, there are um, felt to be some, or not felt to be, there are some genetic variations uh, that can be recognized, particularly in women who have a history of multi-organ uh, cancers, particularly related to the, um, their gynecologic systems. So individuals with uh, breast cancer, ovarian, or uterine cancer have an uh, increased risk of colorectal cancer. And so we advocate for a more intensive and earlier screening and surveillance for those individuals as well. That really makes up the increased risk groups. But uh, you know, I, I hasten to emphasize that it's really the average risk population that we're targeting in this type of, of um, education and promotion. Everyone uh, is an average risk, at least an average risk uh, a patient for colorectal cancer, and that's why we strongly advocate for routine screening of all individuals uh, at age 50. There are symptoms related to colon cancer, but the, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, patients only develop symptoms when they have at least locally advanced disease. And this is important to, to reemphasize because Early cancer and precancer, which is the stage that we really want to identify and impact on patients, is a silent process. So colon cancer is a silent disease until it's advanced. And so by the time patients develop rectal bleeding, they witness blood in the, in the stool or in the commode, uh, if they have an alteration in the caliber of stools or an alteration in the bowel pattern, stomach cramps, unexplained weight loss, uh, alteration of the bowel pattern with diarrhea or constipation, God forbid, nausea, vomiting, feeling tired all the time. Well, these may be symptoms of more advanced disease. But let's face it, who among you has not experienced one or more of those symptoms? So that's, uh, again, the emphasis for getting your routine screening. Because the key is, once you've had your screening, well, then you've obtained your peace of mind. And so you can enjoy these various symptoms without the concern of colon cancer. <laughs> So to reemphasize, uh, screening for colorectal cancer is important. It really is important. It's life-saving. And uh, we, I have to say, as, as a gastroenterologist and as, um, uh, as a, a leader in the uh, uh, endoscopy society, um, we've had some wonderful news uh, during this past year. The National Cancer Institute uh, has um, uh, published data in the beginning of 2010 that showed the dramatic reduction in mortality uh, attributed to colon cancer, and uh, this has been, um, uh, that, that decrease has been associated with the adoption of colonoscopy and polypectomy. And a study that was published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine represented a 20-year follow-up from a, a landmark trial called the National Polyp Study. And in the National Polyp Study, patients, average risk individuals were um, uh, subjected to colonoscopy and then followed uh, for 20 years. And um, uh, patients who had polyps identified uh, were recommended for different periods of uh, surveillance. And uh, some of the patients opted to uh, uh, participate in that and others did not. And what the, the study dramatically showed was a greater than 50% reduction in colorectal cancer mortality. And this is the first trial that has definitively proven, demonstrated uh, what we had all known uh, to be in, implicitly 
to be the case that colonoscopy with polypectomy identification and removal of these precancerous polyps prevents advanced cancer from forming and prevents mortality associated with cancer. So this slide is intended to reemphasize that screening for colon cancer should begin at age 50 in both men and women at average risk um, and that those individuals who are deemed to be at higher risk, the individuals that I identified and particularly then individuals who have polyps identified at colonoscopy should continue with, uh, uh, with the surveillance. Uh, we identify or attempt to identify with uh, uh, visits to your primary care physician men and women who may be at higher risk for the reasons that I described and we uh, would advocate for uh, screening and surveillance in those individuals at a younger age, generally at 40 or 45. A lot of it has to do with, um, with what your individual risk is. If you had a first degree relative who had cancer at a young age, then we pick an age 10 years in advance of, of, uh, of the age at which the cancer was uh, diagnosed or presented. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk to you about pertaining to this. I'm sure we'll come to it. So um, earlier screening for higher risk patients, those uh, with a personal history of, uh, of adenomatous polyps. Oh, that's the reason I wanted to talk to you about this. You know, the term polyp is, is a morphologic term. It means, uh, refers to any uh, mound of tissue that is raised above the otherwise flat surface relief pattern of the colon. But colon polyps um, can be uh, of, of a number of variety. And when we look at a polyp, when we see a polyp through the endoscope, we cannot uh, always reliably discriminate what its true nature is. And that's why polyps are sampled either with a biopsy and in most cases, they're removed in their entirety. And then that specimen is submitted to the pathologist who then look at it under the microscope. And they're able to then discriminate what the nature of that polyp is. So polyps in the colon, the, there are three common types. One is hyperplastic. And um, uh, this type of polyp is an exuberant growth of otherwise normal colon tissue. When identified in isolated forms and small in size, they do not confer a substantial increased risk of colon cancer. And that's distinct from what are called adenomas. And the term adenoma means an abnormal growth of tissue that's not cancer but has the potential to turn into cancer. So these are the precancerous polyps. These are really the quarry uh, that we're after when we're doing a screening and surveillance colonoscopy. And more recently, there's been identified uh, recognized a um, a variation in polyps that's uh, almost a hybrid between hyperplastic polyps and adenomatous polyps called a serrated adenoma. And what we've observed is that um, these types of polyps are being identified with increasing frequency in, uh, in the United States. They're being seen uh, with a different morphology. Historically, polyps were thought to, or were most recognized as a mushroom-shaped uh, uh, protuberance but these sessile serrated adenomas are very flat, they're very subtle, and um, they can be very difficult to recognize. And in fact, um, uh, you know, prior generations of colonoscopists were not so uh, perhaps trained to recognize this type of polyp. And they've moved from the left side of the colon to the right side of the colon. So there's, there's quite a bit of uh, good work yet to be done uh, to ensure that we uh, improve recognition and detection of these types of lesions. Uh, family history uh, I've already uh, uh, alluded to, and the, the strongest association is uh, uh, when there is a first degree relative uh, who has colon cancer or colon polyps. So if you have a first degree relative with a, just a colon adenoma, your individual risk is increased at 1.5 uh, or, or uh, greater than uh, your average risk. Um, there are some hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes, specifically familial adenomatous polyposis. These are uh, either uh, hereditary or, or, or spontaneous gene mutations that uh, uh, have uh, uh, presentation at much younger ages. These patients are, are destined uh, to develop uh, uh, colon cancer and certain other cancers. And uh, the importance is uh, recognition of these in families and insurance that those patients get very specialty care uh, to uh, prevent colon cancer from developing. And lastly is, is, a, is a, a concept uh, referred to as hereditary non-polyposis cancer 
uh, syndrome or HNPCC. And this is another nuanced group that has some genetic variations that exposes these patients again to an increased risk of cancer. We recognize these patients when they have multiple polyps, um, uh, and, and this means more than six polyps, and when they have uh, family histories of colon cancer at young age or other uh, cancers, particularly gynecologic type cancers within their family. So these are useful questions to uh, uh, address with your, with your physician or your, your gastroenterologist uh, when you're contemplating timing and intervals for colorectal cancer screening and surveillance. As I've already alluded to, uh, screening really does make a difference. Um, colorectal cancer is, is one of the few very preventable cancers. Um, and um, uh, we can do this, uh, we are doing this, but we need to do a better job. And um, even early detected colon cancer can be cured, can be treated with uh, operative resection and adjunctive chemotherapy and radiation therapy in many instances. It's highly treatable when it's found at early stages. It's highly lethal when it's uh, identified in its advanced stages. There are, are a number of different approaches to colorectal cancer screening that have been uh, um, uh, utilized uh, um, uh, over the years. The U.S. Preventative Health Services Task Force endorses uh, the five that are listed here and it's probably worthwhile discussing these to some extent. Um, the first is that of yearly fecal occult blood testing and, uh, and immunohistochemical testing, flexible sigmoidoscopy, um, combination of uh, fecal occult blood testing and sigmoidoscopy, double contrast barium enema, and colonoscopy. So fecal occult blood testing is intended to detect blood hidden in the stool. Uh, so if colon cancers um, uh, leak blood, uh, then uh, microscopic uh, amounts of this could be uh, identified within the fecal material. I've seen some of you crinkle up your noses, and that's the problem with fecal occult blood testing. It is an unsavory enterprise. Um, and uh, while it is effective, uh, but it's effective almost as a surrogate, because again, we're really interested in identifying patients with pre-cancer rather than already uh, present cancer. Um, uh, fecal immunohistochemical testing, or FIT testing, is an exciting uh, introduction into this area because it has a marked increased uh, sensitivity and specificity for uh, early cancer and pre-cancer lesions but its, uh, it's true effect is really currently under uh, evaluation. I mention this because several insurance companies have, uh, are promoting this as a primary screening tool, uh, both in Pennsylvania and, and around the country. There's a large um, trial that's going to be going on in Canada now. Now, recognize these, these are, are being um, uh, conducted with uh, an idea that this may be a way to expose more patients to screening than are currently getting screened and as a means to, uh, to, to manage cost. Uh, the problem with uh, fecal occult blood testing is that uh, uh, compliance on the part of patients is, is poor um, because of the nose crinkle factor that I already alluded to. And so um, it's effective. Uh, it helps to, uh, uh, to minimize uh, uh, cancer risk, but recognize any positive fecal occult blood test uh, is going to lead to colonoscopy. So that's, it's, that's, that's the real thing that changes the outcome, um, but worthwhile knowing. Sigmoidoscopy is, um, is an abbreviated colonoscopy. It's a test that uses a uh, shorter uh, colonoscope. It had been embraced uh, 20 years ago uh, because it could be conducted uh, safely, effectively, efficiently, uh, speedily in an office setting. Um, by uh, a gastroenterologist and non-gastroenterologist was its initial intent. Um, but it only evaluates a portion of the colon, and some would uh, akin this to doing a mammography on only one breast. Um, the expectation was that it would recognize lesions in the left colon, and that would then lead to total colonoscopy for removing other lesions. And that was more valuable when uh, colon cancer predominated in the left colon. As I pr said previously, there's been a shift in the United States from left-sided lesions to right-sided lesions. The real problem with sigmoidoscopy is it's done without sedation, and we Americans uh, are not uh, very much amused by um, 
uh, discomfort. And uh, sigmoidoscopy is unpleasant. Uh, and so uh, I'll describe one of the, the, the substantial difference between uh, the adoption of sigmoidoscopy versus colonoscopy. Sigmoidoscopy does work. There are good uh, case control trials that have uh, supported its effectiveness in reducing colorectal cancer death. Uh, it just, again, is not widely embraced. Um, that brings us to the potential combination of these two. If, uh, if, if, if each of them are, are pretty good, if you combine them, that may be even better. Uh, so again, this is supported by the U.S. Preventive Health Services Task Force and adopted by few. Uh, lastly is barium enema. Uh, barium enema is an x-ray test. Um, you have to take a preparation to cleanse the bowel for this. Uh, an um, uh, uh, x-ray contrast is uh, uh, infused into the rectum and then the radiologist uh, takes pictures of the, uh, of the colon. Uh, and again, it's a test that's used to identify precancer lesions that then would lead to colonoscopy. Um, the, um, this uh, was uh, an effective tool uh, in the past, uh, but it is not routinely used as a, a screening or surveillance uh, test today. Many of you may be aware of, um, of a concept called uh, virtual colonoscopy. And virtual colonoscopy is a euphemistic uh, term uh, that uh, the radiologist dubbed for CT colonography. And it harnesses really the power of uh, high resolution uh, uh, CT scan imaging to uh, recreate a three-dimensional construct of the colon and uh, they can really uh, develop some beautiful images of the colon and in many centers this has been demonstrated to be uh, a, uh, uh, a sensitive and specific tool for identifying colorectal lesions uh, of uh, a certain dimension uh, and again um, uh, identification of these lesions on a virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography uh, would then direct one to uh, colonoscopy. For the most part, it's utilized in individuals who, for any variety of reasons, may not be candidates to undergo um, uh, surveillance or screening colonoscopy in and of itself. And that brings us to the king. Um, as you haven't noticed, I may be biased, um, but it's a bias based on knowledge. Um, colonoscopy is uh, the use of a flexible uh, instrument that has a, uh, a light source on its tip that illuminates the bowel and a video chip that functions as a, as a live video camera. The um, colonoscope is able to be advanced throughout the entire colon. Um, because the, the, uh, uh, it is an, a minimally invasive procedure, it's performed with sedation, and the sedation can be light or, or heavy sedation. But the sedation is intended uh, so that the patient experiences little or no discomfort during the procedure and generally has no memory of the procedure when it's completed. And this facilitates the direct visualization of the entire lining of the colon. And most importantly, it permits removal uh, of uh, uh, precancerous lesions in the colon. And uh, because of this, it, it really is the uh, tool that impacts on uh, patient outcomes with reduction in colon cancer. Uh, it does require a preparation. Um, you know, I think colonoscopy has, has it's, it suffers from bad public relations. Um, the, the concept of having a colonoscopy is, is almost immediately uh, uh, envisioned as, as uh, unpleasant, undesirable. And that's really part of, uh, of, of your mission as you go from this type of conference is to, is to really help to demystify the, uh, the concept of colonoscopy. It really isn't a big deal. And, um, uh, and when you consider the uh, life-saving uh, benefits of it, uh, that certainly is, is, is a small uh, bit of sacrifice in terms of, of preparation uh, to undergo the procedure. This is uh, just some images that uh, we would see at colonoscopy. This is that typical uh, pedunculated mushroom-shaped polyp that we identify, and this is a cartoon showing how we use wire loop snares so with electrosurgical energy to resect and cauterize uh, these lesions that uh, uh, eliminate the uh, uh, possibility that this lesion would go on to develop uh, carcinoma. When uh, polyps are identified, uh, they can be resected at colonoscopy. Some lesions are not candidate lesions for, for a colonoscopic resection. In those cases, surgery or operative resection is indicated. Colonoscopy can cure precancerous lesions 
and early cancers, that is cancers that have, are limited to the surface or the mucosal layer. Once cancer has invaded into the submucosa or just under the surface layer, there's an increased risk of cancer cells having spread to regional lymph nodes. And when that occurs, we generally recommend operative resection because not only does the surgery remove that segment of the bowel that contains the cancer, but it removes the lymphatics that drain the region and are the harbinger, potential harbinger of, uh, of cancer cells that would otherwise have the opportunity to remain in the body and spread to other portions of the body. When patients are identified with uh, early or locally advanced cancers, uh, we then use uh, chemotherapy and in certain instances radiation therapy to boost the uh, benefits of operative resection alone. Um, and this is intended to kill any uh, circulating cancer cells and to best ensure long-term cancer-free survival. And the strides, the really very positive um, uh, uh, steps that have gone forward uh, with chemotherapy and radiation therapy for colorectal cancer are astounding. We've really uh, substantially increased the um, uh, long-term cancer-free survival uh, for this disease. So uh, it's a big yes uh, that you can survive uh, colon cancer and survive it very well. The earlier the cancer is diagnosed, the better your chance of long-term cancer-free survival. And so early stage cancer, let me, just to preface this, if we find uh, pre-cancer, uh, the survival rate, of course, is 100%. Uh, early stage cancers with five-year survivals at 90%. Later stage cancers, less so. I'm asked to just uh, uh, provide this slide uh, where you can get more information from the uh, 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 Pennsylvania Department of Health and their Cancer Education Network. So you can refer to this in the, in the materials that you can obtain uh, uh, from the website. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the network of the Pennsylvania Cancer Education Network that's funded by uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health through a grant from, uh, that the department receives from the, the CDC, the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention in Atlanta. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. And um, I'll take uh, maybe a few moments for questions, please. Yes, would you like to come up to the microphone? microphone right in the center there, and if you uh, just maybe identify uh, right here. Well, you're going to have to get closer to the microphone than that. <laughs> I'm Viola Anderson, and I'm a patient at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, just recently, my uh, colonoscopy has changed from, I believe it was a year or two years each, and I've learned now that you can uh, have it every 10 years. So, so, that's, so thank you for asking this question. The question posed pertains to the recommended interval for subsequent colonoscopic surveillance. That's a very important point. And the recommended interval for subsequent colonoscopy surveillance is very much individualized. And there are guidelines that are developed based on risk associated with the number the size, and the type of polyp that is identified. So among individuals who've had a screening or surveillance colonoscopy with polyps identified, there really is an algorithm that is developed to, uh, to make recommendations for the appropriate interval for subsequent colonoscopic surveillance. Now that is further influenced by the colonoscopist determination as to the degree to which they are satisfied that they've been able to uh, clear the colon and much of that is dependent on the quality of the preparation. So there are, it's not uncommon that even despite the patient's best effort, that they may have uh, little or sometimes substantial uh, residual contents in the colon. And that may be deemed to compromise the quality of the colonoscopy. And so when uh, the endoscopist makes a determination that they're not satisfied with the quality of the preparation, that's an indication to, to shorten that interval for um, surveillance. The 10-year interval that was posted in the slide here is that that's recommended by the U.S. Preventive Health Service Task Force for average-risk individuals who've had a clearance colonoscopy at age 50. So that interval may not apply to you. So I think it does, it has uh, answered part of my question. But my main question was, as far as the polyps that were being moved, removed, 
Oh, they're good and bad colors. Were, uh, because I had been told by a, a secondary doctor that the pops that they removed from my bone, which was each time I had it, mm -hmm. there was one that was to be removed. Okay. But he said it was nice and clear and Right. So the, the, why we would not classify polyps into good or bad, we know there are bad ones. And, um, and, and uh, um, what I was referring to earlier was that there are different types of polyps. And so one type of polyp that are commonly identified and removed are hyperplastic polyps. And these polyps, one might say, are a good polyp. It, they're good because they are not associated with an increased risk of developing cancer. And so, uh, so if you have multiple small hyperplastic polyps removed, that would co co uh, be considered a, a true clearance colonoscopy. And, and so the interval for subsequent uh, surveillance in you might be extended to three years, five years, or even 10 years, depending on your individual factors. And so uh, shall we assume that uh, the doctor who does the colonoscopy, you That's correct. Of what your condition is. Uh, and and I, I would just say, you know, the purpose of this type of conference is to empower you as patients and as advocates for your fellow patients to understand the right questions to ask your physician. And so what I would highly advocate for each of you is that you have that conversation with your doctor and say, what are the factors upon which you have determined this designation for my subsequent interval colonoscopy. Okay, so I'll ask one more question, that's it. Um, I go to my primary doctor mainly, who ha is the one who's determined that I should just come every 10 years, so have yeah. it every 10 years. I'm wondering, should I have gotten this information directly from the uh, doctor who took the test? Well, you know, test? we expect that our physicians communicate with one another. Now that is an expectation. Um, and and, it, and I, that, that, I think, is the question that you want to pose to your primary physician and uh, to get some degree of satisfaction from that. And if you determine that that kind of communication is not occurring, then it, you're, you're, it is certainly appropriate for you to communicate back with the, uh, with the physician who performed your colonoscopy to get that affirmation. Good. Well, those are really good questions, and thank you for allowing me to touch on, I think, what are some important points. Hello there. Um, question, is there any thoughts or reasonings to why maybe polyps are shifting from left side to the right side? Yeah. So um, there are many thoughts. Uh, and um, and um, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's very much uncertain at this time. What has been uh, really remarkable is that we, we've come to recognize that there's, there's really a different molecular or, or pathway that is occurring in, these, in the progression of these sessile serrated adenomas to cancer compared to a tr typical tubular adenoma in its progression to cancer. We don't know uh, what the uh, reasons for this are. We suspect that it has uh, uh, considerable to do with, uh, with uh, the way we live our lives and particularly the diets that we consume. Um, and so this is an active area for research, and um, uh, I, I know uh, Dr. Rusky is going to be speaking later. This is a question that we might ask him to uh, opine on as well. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Verna Cox with Colon Cancer Alliance, and knowing that so many of us here in the room are trying to spread awareness, uh, I wanted to make you aware that there's a Screen for Life program here in Pennsylvania uh, funded by the CDC. And it is for people who are uninsured and underinsured that they can have access to a colonoscopy. So if you know of people that cannot take advantage of Penn or some of the other excellent uh, GI facilities, uh, here in Philadelphia, they can go to their local uh, Philadelphia Health Clinic and inquire there about getting a colonoscopy. They actually do have funding. Thank you. That's a really important point and allow me to uh, let you know that there's legislation that's being introduced into Congress now that will ensure that uh, uh, all uh, individuals have uh, coverage for uh, average or screening colonoscopy and uh, 
Congress unintentionally uh, created a, um, a snag in uh, pre-existing legislation that um, led to uh, payment for screening colonoscopy, but if a polyp was found, they wouldn't cover the costs of removing and processing the polyp. And so patients' knowledge and concern about this, uh, we feel, is an impediment. It, it, it puts patients who may be marginally uh, or marginalized from a socioeconomic standpoint uh, to be really put off. So um, uh, this legislation is, is, is going forward currently. Or the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy has, has been instrumental in, um, in promoting this, and, and likely uh, that information it certainly can be found if you go to the ASGE website, which is www.asge.org, and perhaps uh, it's uh, recognizable through the uh, Colon Cancer Awareness website as well. We have another question here? Um, good afternoon. Good morning. Both good morning. of my parents had colon cancer, and my father died at the age of 64. My mother had a colon resection at age 80 and lived to 90. So I have a question about whether or not I should be tested for gene <coughs> markers. And my second question is, if one has, is predisposed to colon cancer, can the cancer occur in other parts of your body before it's even manifested in the colon? Okay, so, um, so two questions, two good questions. Um, in, in your individual instance, um, your, uh, you know, colon cancer is, is a fairly common uh, disease. As you saw, it's, it's the third most common uh, cancer in men and women in the United States. So um, the, the fact that both mother and father had colon cancer in, is, is more apt to be coincident. Uh, and you are not, at, because of the age that uh, your parents were diagnosed, that does not suggest that you would be at a syndromic risk, that is a genetic variation in you. Nonetheless, you sure are at increased risk and, and uh, hopefully have, uh, have already taken care of your uh, uh, personal duty in, in having a, uh, a, a screening colonoscopy performed. And certainly in someone like you, we'd be inclined, I think, to uh, have at least up front a more intensive surveillance interval uh, than say 10 years if you had an initial clearance colonoscopy. If you were an individual patient of mine, I would, I would uh, advocate for a shorter interval because colonoscopy is not perfect. It's, it's, it's the best, but it's, it's imperfect. And that's the, that's the reason for doing periodic uh, surveillance, or part of the reason for doing uh, periodic surveillance exams. The second question pertains to could colon cancer originate elsewhere in your body? Well, the answer fortunately is no. Uh, uh, colon cancer arises from the surface of the, of the colon and the rectum, and so it will not originate in some other locus. And there's nothing about your personal history that suggests that you're particularly at increased risk for cancer in any of your, your other organ systems. Okay. So hopefully that helps. All right. Well, I think if there are no other questions, we'll, we'll cut a, a little bit. Oh, we have one more here. Well, I, I took it not because I would, was at risk, but I guess because I'm like a baby a senior, and uh, I'm in my 50s, so they were, I had insurance, and the doctor said to do it. But what I want to say is I was really, had a very good experience uh, at, uh, I don't know if I should mention it, I don't want to create competition, but wherever it was, it was just very, um, like you say, I had no memory of it. It was painless. And the, the guy, I felt really, uh, the doctor himself, he communicated to me, as opposed to this woman who said her primary community to her, that everything was normal, it would be 10 years, and apparently in his own family, there was a problem with his grandfather or something. So he was very dedicated. And uh, so I, I must say my experience in this area was uh, very positive. Good. Well, what we so know I is just that, wanted to let that, people that, know that there, that, um, there are, um, there's excellent quality uh, in colonoscopy uh, throughout the Philadelphia region and, and throughout our country. It's important that you do know that the individual that's uh, performing your uh, procedure is a, you know, a trained uh, gastroenterologist or, or colorectal surgeon. And um, uh, 
Uh, and of course, if you, if you really want it done best, then you come to Penn, that's all. Uh, okay, well with that, um, I'd like to bring up uh, uh, Carolyn Vacani. And Carolyn is um, uh, one of our premier Oncolink nurse educators, and she's going to uh, talk about Oncolink.org and uh, how we can use that as a tool to identify uh, individual cancer risk. Thanks, Carolyn. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a program um, on our website that you might find helpful. Um, it's not specifically about colon cancer, but all cancers in general. So let me just take a minute and tell you about Oncolink. So if you're not familiar with us, we were the first cancer information website on the internet, started in 1994. Um, if you remember back to 94, there really was nothing on the internet in 94, so we were kind of a pioneer. We had a physician at Penn who thought the internet was pretty cool and just built this cool website for fun. <laughs> and here we are 18 years later and still um, going strong. So somehow we lost, there we go. Um, our content is written by nurses, physicians, dietitians, social workers, um, mostly people who are in the clinic seeing patients. We have a few survivors who write things for us. Um, and that kind of makes us a little bit unique. A lot of sites that are out there hire medical writers who, you know, they can read about a topic and write about it, where our writers are people who are kind of in that um, field every day. It's free. You don't have to register for anything. Just go to the um, website, oncolink.org, and everything's there for you. We have information from everything from a novice um, patient all the way up to uh, physicians and nurses, and we don't segregate that information. So you, as the person on the site, can go as deep as you like, read as um, in detail as you want to. So cancer risk is something we kind of got a little interested in in the past couple years because we would see um, patients and their family members in the clinic and, you know, they want to be there to support the patient, but at the same time they're thinking to themselves, why wasn't this me? Why am I not the person sitting in that chair getting this diagnosis? What makes me different? Um, and they're worried about their own risk, understandably. Um, so we wanted to create a program that would help people understand their own cancer risk and then learn what they can do about it to reduce risk. So you'll learn a little bit about um, risk today. This thing's a little jumpy. Um, about cancer risk in general today and then more about colon cancer risk today. Um, what we can say is that cancer risk really isn't an exact science. People want you to be able to tell them you have a 23% chance of getting XYZ cancer. And in most cases, we really can't do that. We can give you general numbers um, based on the population and um, your specific, you know, ethnicity, age, family history, that kind of stuff. But we really can't give you a, a, one, a guaranteed answer. Um, so what's more important is learning about risk factors, um, some that you can modify or change and some that you can't. And then for the ones that you can change, how can you do that? So the program um, basically is a detailed questionnaire. You'll answer questions about health history, um, social history, um, things like smoking, alcohol, uh, weight, diet, um, all kinds of things it asks you about. And then it um, takes these, your answers to these questions and translates that into information about what you might be at risk for. Um, it's to help you identify your own risk factors and then more importantly, what can you do about those? So this is what the page looks like. Um, it gives you a little bit of an introduction to cancer risk that you can read about at your leisure. Um, and then you begin the questionnaire, and you'll see it asks you a whole bunch of questions about if you had any smoking history, alcohol, um, weight, 
one page. Well, there's about five pages to the questionnaire. It takes maybe 10 minutes to fill it out, so it's not too um, labor intensive. Uh, and then your result is something like this. So you get a chart that is a little bit visual, so it tells you different types of cancer and what um, risk factors were identified in your questionnaire that increase your risk for that type of cancer. So it's sort of looking at all cancers out there, not just um, you know one or two. And then it will break down for you yeah, I do. Modifiable risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors, tips for prevention and screening, and then information about family history. So it will ask you if you have any family history of cancers and what they are, and it'll give you some information about that as well. Um, when it talks about modifiable risk factors, it gives you all kinds. So here's for someone who's a current smoker. It gives them all kinds of information about um, how to estimate their lung cancer risk, what about quitting, what's the benefit to quitting. A lot of people think, you know, I've been smoking 30 years, what's the benefit to quitting now? Well, there's always a benefit, um, and you can read more about that in here. Um, and resources to get you to quit. Um, so, you know, quitting by yourself is not so easy, so. So I or encourage you to go online, take the program, and get informed and learn about cancer risk and see what you can do to decrease your risk. Thanks. Actually, do you mind? Um, we have a, an opportunity for questions uh, for Carolyn. Your um, presentation made me, uh, made me think that, uh, you know, in, in 1994, um, there were virtually no cell phones, there were no Blackberries, no iPhones, there was really virtually almost no internet. And so uh, it is, it, you know, truly, um, Uncle Link was the, the pioneer, and it really remains the premier cancer information network uh, uh, on, on, the, on the WWW. So while Al Gore may have um, exaggerated when he suggested that he invented the World Wide Web, you guys really did invent uh, the cancer on the web. So thanks very much. Well, uh, next then, I, I, I can't tell you how really pleased I am to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, uh, Stephen Wirth is... Um, is here as a uh, colorectal cancer awareness advocate. And uh, Stephen Wirth is an enthusiastic advocate for early colon cancer screening, which likely saved his life. And he's living a very active and healthy lifestyle, including serving his community as a volunteer fire, firefighter. He was recommended for an operative resection. Uh, not accepting that, um, Steve did as many people do, and he, he retreated to the web. and. Um, uh, he uh, came to identify uh, some uh, information pertaining to new and novel ways to address uh, what we call defiant colon polyps that are lesions that cannot be removed by standard techniques, but, um, but uh, places like Penn, we have uh, developed some tools and techniques to, uh, to cure many of these. Um, he had a successful therapy and uh, uh, he has um, uh, been uh, very much uh, willing to uh, participate with the Abramson Cancer Center uh, in our promotion of uh, colon cancer awareness and prevention. Last year he completed a 500 mile bicycle trip from, from Boston to Washington DC as part of the National EMS Memorial Bike Ride. He's very active in, uh, uh, in the, the EMS Society uh, and functions really as, a, as an attorney for them. Uh, and he did this bike ride to honor those emergency service providers who have died in, in their line of duty. So. Uh, you can already tell he's really an exceptional individual, and um, so I, I welcome here here today to talk uh, on a really new topic for him as an advocate for colon cancer prevention and screening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent. Well, I have to say I'm, I'm a strong advocate for uh, early detection of colon cancer. Obviously, as Dr. Ginsburg, my doctor. Uh, just spoke about. Um, 
and I'm a uh, volunteer spokesperson. Uh, I'm not paid to be here. All I was given was this little sheet on speaker guidelines which says, please, no mortality rates and charts and no graphic photographs of surgery, tumors, et cetera, that could be disturbing to the non-medical audience. So I have no slides, okay? <laughs> so, um, listening to uh, Dr. Ginsburg speak about uh, the procedures and so forth that they do here at Penn, uh, he did sort of gloss over one risk factor, one, one sort of effect here. No memory of the procedure, I heard him say. Well, uh, I think that is a significant risk, okay? The humorist Dave Barry, who writes a lot of books, uh, he uh, spoke about and wrote about his age 50 colonoscopy very eloquently. Um, and he commented that uh, he interviewed uh, various uh, uh, endoscopists and doctors that do these procedures. And he said, well, what do people say when they're in there? Uh, and, and these are a few of the things they actually say when they're in the suite under the anesthesia. One patient said, can you hear me now? Uh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Hey, doc, uh, let me know if you find my dignity. Uh, uh, the one about the executive at Enron, I'll skip that. Uh, the best one, though, was this one I thought was uh, a patient supposedly said under this light anesthesia. Uh, could you please write a, a note for my wife saying that my head is not up there? <laughs> So, uh, but, you know, when you can talk about that as being the, uh, the biggest risk, I think that's, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm 53 years old. Uh, I uh, have always tried to live a healthy lifestyle, you know, and I uh, ate well. I didn't smoke cigarettes, you know. I drink a little alcohol now and then. Uh, but, uh, you know, I try to follow the recommendations. So uh, age 50 came along and it's like, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna do this, okay. I delayed for about a year uh, to go in to my local community. I'm from outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, about two hours away from here. And I just went in routine. I had no symptoms at all, nothing, you know, I was fine. And, uh, went in, had the procedure done. It was uh, a physician and a nurse in the room uh, came out, and afterwards, after I'd come out of the sedation, uh, he said, I want to talk to you. And my uh, girlfriend and I were there, and we went into his office. He says, I do about a thousand of these. And he says, you're about uh, four or five that I see a year that have this problem. And I knew the news wasn't going to be good, okay? Well, they did a biopsy, but he said right away, he says, you know, you had a very large flat polyp, okay? And I couldn't get it all out, and that concerned me. He says, but it's easy, he says, we'll just sign up over here. My surgeon over here will easily do this procedure to remove that part of your colon. And I said, what, remove part of my colon? You've got to be kidding me. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, he says, yes, it's a normal procedure, no big deal. I said, what are the risks? Well, there's, he started rattling off a few of the risks. And I said, you know, the idea of having a third of my colon removed at age 51, at that point, wasn't too enticing to me, okay? Uh, and I was really concerned because he had apparently tried to get the thing out and, you know, there's, now I got this mess going on probably. Well, I did, as Dr. Ginsburg said, I jumped on the internet. And I think the important thing for everybody in this room is you gotta take control of your own health care. Uh, plain and simple. You can't trust what everybody tells you, okay? And you need to seek out alternate opinions and information. You need to learn all about this stuff on your own. Uh, and that's what I did. And I came across a fella, uh, he has his own website, because he's like me, he, was a, he had a similar situation. He had the same exact polyp that I had, one of these flat, sessile polyps that were an adenoma. Is that right? I get that right? <laughs> and uh, he likes to call them defiant. I like that word. It's almost like you're going to go in and get that thing out of there, you know, defiant, get it out of there. Uh, guy named Jim Cease, S-E-A-S-E. He put all his stuff on a website. It's cease.com, S-E-A-S-E.com. 
and he told his story about how he went in for his exam and all that. And he had the same deal. I'm reading his stories. His doctor said, take a third of your colon out. It's no big deal. You might have to have a colonoscopy bag, but you know, okay, you live a normal life generally. Uh-uh, no thanks, okay? And uh, it was the exact polyp. It even looked like mine. It was in the same location, that upper right part of your colon that Dr. Ginsburg said, you know, a lot of these things are ending up over there now. And, uh, and he uh, had a bunch of links, you know, to, to physicians that did these innovative procedures that didn't require uh, surgery, you know. And uh, I was reading an article, and it, there was nobody from Pennsylvania uh, right on his list. And then I read an article that he had posted, and one of the commenters to the article was Dr. Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. And commenting on this new procedure, and what do you call that? Thank you. Endoscopic mucosal resection, you know. And I'm a rescue guy. I'm a firefighter paramedic. It's sort of like, you know, when you have a car wreck and the car's on its roof and there's patients inside, you stick something under the car and you inflate it like a bag to lift it off. Is that fairly close? Okay. And uh, really cool procedure. And I said, well, okay, that's the guy I want to go to. So what do I do? I just go to the website for Penn Medicine. I online, never spoke to anybody, just signed up, got an appointment within two days. He saw me in three or four weeks and had the procedure. He got all my records and did the procedure. I did not have to have a third of my colon removed, okay? Uh, and uh, he was able to, to get it all out. And, uh, you know, I've gone back once or twice since then. And now I think I'm on the three-year cycle for next, next time getting checked. But what really helped me so much was the ability to, you know, recognize that I had to take responsibility and I had to get it done. The procedure is a breeze. I mean, uh, some of you in this room, I got talking to the folks over here at this table who've been through uh, procedures. Uh, the procedure is easy. In fact, frankly, I, I kind of enjoyed it. I, I shouldn't say that, but... <laughs> You know, it makes you feel kind of giddy, you know, and this thing that Dave Barry talked about, you know, my girlfriend came in at recovery, she caught me flirting with the nurses, you know, and sort of that, and I'm not sure what I said, but it was, it was really an interesting procedure, and you don't remember the details, you know. It was no discomfort whatsoever, none at all, no pain, no, pr a little bit of pressure, but not even to the point that it bothers you. And it's done in about 15, 20 minutes, and uh, it's wonderful. And I can tell you, the place I want to go, this is my personal experience. I believe there's a lot of physicians out there in the, this country. I like to call them the snare and snip docs, okay? They're able to go in, you know, one doc, and they take their little thing in there, and if there's these polyps like Dr. Ginsburg's talking about that stick out, oh, we just snip them off. That's easy work. Okay, but you deal with some of these newer polyps that he's talking about, it takes some skill. It takes good equipment. And I want to go to a place where they've got highly trained people. When I walk into that procedure and they're running off a safety checklist and there's five or six people in the room that are learning how to do this stuff so that he can pass it on to, to those uh, coming up in the ranks, that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. The ability to have a resource here like Penn, uh, I would go no other place. My physician back home, uh, which Dr. Ginsburg kept him up to date with the reports, asked me if I was coming back for a screening, and I just kindly said, no, I won't. I'll drive the two hours. Uh, but the procedure is easy. The prep is no big deal. In fact, there's a great benefit from that. If you want to lose a couple of pounds, two or three pound weight loss program for the week, you know? So, uh, you know, it's an easy thing to do. And I have to tell you, I've been able to continue my lifestyle. I, had no, and I never skipped the beat. Uh, and uh, I'm just so thankful that we have the resources like we have here in, in this community with Penn Medicine and the Perlman Center and Dr. Ginsburg and the whole team here. Uh, they really are a team. And you know what? You know, some people get concerned about going to a big medical center, that they're going to treat you like a number. Well, they do to an extent. You've got to get a number and all that. But it's an efficient place. 
and they were very caring people. Uh, I really, not a single bad experience I had, and I've been here three times now, and uh, just wonderful, wonderful experience. I've since, uh, now I'm a grandfather. I have a grandchild born uh, six weeks ago. And thanks to this man here, I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to be around in six, ten years. Because, you know, if I had not had the procedure done, the likelihood was probably six to ten years, somewhere in that range, that my precancerous polyp could have been cancer, grown into full-blown cancer. And some of you are actual cancer survivors, and that's a wonderful thing. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that, uh, you know, you, you tend to sometimes underappreciate some of the resources you, you have in your community, and we've got great resources here. Um, any questions? I'm, I'm here to answer questions, and yes, ma'am. That was weird. I think, that was a little uh, kind of, but that your doctor, thing, this other part, this is something separate, what you're talking about, that you have a, a some kind of very stubborn, flat something. That's what I got. That yeah. that maybe would resist, what was it, a colonoscopy that was done? And where that was Abs shown yep, up? Absolutely. So, yeah. and, uh, so, so how, I don't understand. Did they go, you know, in, inside again and cut? Were they full sophisticated? No, uh, they, they, they do the procedure. As it's a regular colonoscopy. They just wind the tube up there to the you know, right side of your colon there, and it's done just like with a colonoscopy. I mean, that's well, the yeah. way it was removed? And that, it was that's all the way removed the piece right was during removed. that procedure. He could speak to it better. It's important to recognize is that um, we, we need uh, good screening and surveillance colonoscopy. When lesions like... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> like the one that uh, was identified in Mr. Worth, are recognized. They should, ideally, really, they should be simply photographed, documented, and then sent to someone who has expertise to uh, uh, to uh, remove those types of lesions. Most polyps that are identified on routine screening and surveillance colonoscopy are removed by the colonoscopist at that time. At the the it, Mr. Worth's uh, instance represents a lesion that is an advanced uh, adenoma on its way to, to forming cancer, and that requires uh, a, a higher intensity type colonoscopy. With, with, with respect to the, the legislation question you asked, there, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make a bit of sense. That's why it was a, it was a, 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 a foul up by Congress. I, I understand that it's the first time that Congress has ever made a mistake. Um, that's right. But, uh, but, but that's, that's the reason it doesn't make sense in your head, because it doesn't make sense in anyone's head. So, so in other words, though, here. it's a colonoscopy all over again, yes. but it's just a more intensive one. Okay, instead of cutting yeah, you up. Yeah, that's basically it. I just wanted to add, too, that one point I didn't make. i, I got to tell you, every time I meet someone who looks like they're age 50, I ask them, have you had a colonoscopy? And then I tell them my story. Now, it's not generally appropriate dinner discussion, but, you know, uh, you know, friends. And I have a friend of mine who's 56 years old, and he's very rigid and, you know, conservative, doesn't want to, and I keep bugging him. One of these days I'm going to get him turned around. But there is this mystique about it. And now with the techniques and procedures, the anesthesia that's there, you know, uh, it's, it's really uh, an easy thing to do, and there's no reason not to get it done. You know, as I said, not having it done, you could, this thing can fester for years. And as was explained, this is a killer because it's like a silent killer because you don't have symptoms until oftentimes it's way advanced. So uh, that's the thing. Get out there. I look for anybody age 50, you know, and talk to them. Uh, Good morning, Stephen. Yeah. Hi. Hi I'm, I'm Ben Holmes. I'm here with my wife. Hi, she ben. had to step out. Um, she's a Lynch. Uh, survivor, previvor, uh, previvor because she'll continue to get various cancers, but 
Uh, her risk of getting colon cancer is zero because they had to remove it. Great. Um, in, in, in answer to your last question, I'm, I'm turning 50 soon and I have a 24-year-old son who's had more colonoscopies than me because of his mother and, and his uh, yeah. genetics, and I will be getting scheduled. But um, I, what I'd like to cue in on is your introduction. The 500-mile bike ride, the fitness side, um, and I, this is kind of an unabashed plug for something that I'm trying to do to help raise awareness for Lynch syndrome is I have a, a team ask me about Lynch syndrome. I'd like to invite you to join us uh, in the 15K in New York City Central Park coming up on April 1st. We have a team. We're on the website. Uh, and we're, we're also doing a couple other okay, well, let's, mud, mud runs. Let's and, talk. And warrior mud run, stuff. that sounds really fun. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we'd love to invite you to, to oh, join us you. and help raise okay, awareness. Okay, well, let's talk after this and uh, be glad to chat about it. So, uh, yeah, and I think uh, the key is, you know, staying active, exercise. And it doesn't have to be a lot. I don't, you know, I'm not out there, you know, all the time exercising. But just simple things about your diet. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, low fat, high fiber, right? Low fat, high fiber. Amen. There it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, just trying to just pay attention a little bit to your health. And it's, it's not just for your own good. It's for the good of your, your loved ones, you know. And that's the, the beauty of it all is you can really have an impact on your loved ones down the road, too, by taking care of yourself. So I think we have time for yeah. one more question. Yeah, okay. I have one quick question. Okay. I wanted to know... Um, is the polyp and the lesion one and the same? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. You're saying yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, we use uh, sedation uh, for the most part to keep patients comfortable, but some of our patients prefer having a, a light uh, sedation so that they can watch the procedure as you're performing and actually make comments on it uh, while uh, you're performing it. And I will say that on occasion I've given a little extra dose to shut a patient up a little bit so I can concentrate for crying out loud. <laughs> All right, well I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our, our next speaker, uh, John Torino, uh, with the Colon Cancer Alliance. Uh, John is the chairperson for the Southeastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Southern New Jersey chapter of the CCA, and um, among other things, uh, he's going to talk about the UND 5000, and uh, John has been uh, really a tireless uh, uh, advocate for, uh, for colorectal cancer screening and, and prevention, and uh, I welcome him uh, to the podium. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Undy 5000. First off, I'm a 16-year survivor of colon cancer stage two. Um, we're trying to get out awareness, educate the public on preventing uh, colon cancer. And uh, one of the events that we use to do this is our Undy 5000. Um, this event is one of the biggest events for the Colon Cancer Alliance. It takes place in Philadelphia on September the 8th of um, 2012. So what is the Undy 5000? The Undy 5000 is a family-friendly 5K runner walk aimed at to raise awareness about colon cancer and the importance of getting screened by encouraging participants to run in their underwear. Yes, their underwear. But you can wear it over pants and you don't have to really if you don't want to. By encouraging participants to run in their underwear, this event is to draw media attention, give survivors a voice, and get people talking about that area. That's what the focus is. The focus isn't about running, but to bring attention to the colon. How can you help? You can become a sponsor of the Only 5000. Um, we offer a variety of sponsorship opportunities that allow your company to show its support of colon cancer awareness and prevention while also receiving recognition at the event and on collateral materials. You can form a company team with your um, office, uh, develop co-workers co relationships with supporting a good cause. What you want to do is form a team, um, have competition among that team, 
um, getting as many team members as you can to raise funds so that we can give back to that. We, with 81 cents of every dollar going to national and local awareness programs, we are helping the colon cancer alliance on their mission to end the suffering caused by colon cancer. Uh, we encourage awareness and participation, and uh, we become an in sponsor of an under 5,000. Uh, not much is known in Philadelphia. I, I don't know if everybody's afraid of colon cancer, but I'm, I've been a survivor for, well, like I said, 16 years. And I never found the group before. I've always volunteered for other groups, the, the breast cancer walks, mainly just Cancer Society and Breast Cancer Walks. So one day I'm reading Runner's World, and I'm reading this line about running in your underwear. And I said, hmm, this interests me. And I saw the, I mean, it didn't interest me because I was weird, it just interested me. And anyway, I said, Colon Cancer Alliance. I said, where have you been all my life? Um, something here that somebody's got a program that actually works to prevent colon cancer. So that's our mission. Um, you'll be hearing a lot about us, uh, I hope. I hope that I see you all at the 5K wearing your underwear and um, having a good time. Any questions? Uh, I have a, just a question that you could comment on. Um, uh, what the um, venue or, or the mechanism or vehicles that you use for colon cancer or, or prevention, promotion, or advocacy uh, uh, through the funds that um, uh, CCA uh, generates? What we do is, uh, good question, Doctor. What we usually do with those funds, um, we go to hospitals, local GIs, um, to get sponsorships. With this, this money, um, we give back by making uh, sure that these community health partners that we establish with the hospitals um, dig in and give the underinsured and uninsured patients their free screenings. Um, awareness programs, we have health fairs, we have fundraisers to make everybody aware of what kind of educational benefits there are to preventing colon cancer. Um, but basically that's where all our funds go for that. Hi, are these free screenings mainly for patients or clients around the Philadelphia area? Well, we, our chapter deals with New Jersey and Delaware as well. So it would oh. be Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Okay, what about um, areas such as Harrisburg, Reading, yes, Carlisle? Yes, that's, that's part of Pennsylvania. Right, I know that, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm very I'm sorry. aware. <laughs> but my question is, you know, um, your comment kind of led me to think that it was for people here and kind of refer them back here, but go to your local health departments. People in the outlining areas in Delaware, New Jersey, wherever, where would they go to find out about this program? Is there a number they could call to apply? Well, or we have talk cards on our table that you can utilize. Um, we have all the information that you could use. There's a w office in Washington, D.C. They're going to refer you back to us as a chapter to help you along. Okay. Um, so we would give patients the number here, the toll-free helpline. Right. And then from that point on, they will take them and help them get them in a position where they could get a right. screening call. If they're, if they're a community health partner, which means that the hospital that would take over for them um, just determines on what stages, and we went through the stages with Dr. Ginsburg, on on testing procedures, starting with the fecal occult and then going all the way up to the colonoscopy. And that's determined by the hospital, which would be a community health partner. Does that make sense? We have a question up front here. Yeah. Do you know if Reading Hospital is a community health partner? We're currently in, in discussion with the University of Pennsylvania and St. Mary's in Langhorne. We haven't gotten to anybody else yet. So, okay, so the answer is right now let's here and then those two you just mentioned. Yes. As community health partners. Yes. Okay, thank you. When I was speaking to you earlier, I thought you mentioned a program called the Buddy Program that you're instrumental in. Yes. That you would set up a buddy for a person, well, as 
yes. was diagnosed with colon cancer or for a caregiver, but yet you, you didn't speak about that. Here. Well, I have to hold to my agenda, but I can. Oh, I'm that, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, we do take, take a moment. That's fine. We, we do. Um, we, we do have a buddy program, and what they what we do with that buddy pro program is we set up the stage of cancer and the gender, and we match them up with um, similar patients. Um, and this is a vo good volunteer program to exchange what kind of emotions and feelings and treatments that they're going through. So you're sort of like a caregiver as a buddy. Does that make sense to you? It's an awesome experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's for caregivers, as, caregivers, patients, and survivors. It's, a, it's a, a definitely a good program. We also have our CRC Connections that you can join and um, if you have experience and you want to share it with other people you can do that online as well. Okay. I know there's other questions but I'm going to ask um, if, if you meet with uh, with John uh, during the break. Um, at this time, thanks John very much. Thank you. At this time I'd like to introduce uh, Alicia Lamana, Lamana, sorry, who is uh, one of our patient liaisons uh, for the colorectal cancer screening program, I think it's uh, the, some of the questions uh, uh, link very nicely to the topic that Alicia is going to be addressing, and that is help in navigating the screening process. Thanks, Alicia. Good morning. So basically, I'm going to go over some in information today about the West Philadelphia GI outreach and the navigation program we have here. Basically, we, everybody so far has said how much screening is very, very important for everybody. So we've kind of focused in on one area of West Philadelphia for right now. And how I can help you is that we have a gift from an anonymous donation, from a patient actually, and also from the American Cancer Society and Walmart. And they gave us funding that we can help out patients. And we have this funding and we said, well, what could we do with it? So what we did was we have some goals of having a navigator to sit with the patient, go one-on-one -on -one with the patient. In addition to having a navigator, we want to increase awareness all over West Philadelphia, just trying to give basic information like today and to local communities out there. And also what we want to do is we're going to try to show the effectiveness of how navigation can help patients. To increase the awareness throughout West Philadelphia, we've noticed that there's barriers for patients. They, a lot of patients have no knowledge. A lot of patients can't afford their PrEP. A lot of patients cannot afford transportation or they can't even have anybody with them to come pick them up. So when they're having a colonoscopy, they're kind of stuck. So then that means they just don't go, they kind of just stop right there and they don't go anywhere, anywhere forward. So that's where I come through. For right now, our program, we're West Philadelphia, which is the five zip codes here, and there are patients between 50 and 70 years of age. And I kind of call them, I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one and I say, you know, I've noticed that you have a colonoscopy out there, and I kind of just kind of guide them through the whole process. The whole process for patients is that a lot of times, um, excuse me, a lot of times they just get nervous, and a lot of times they just want somebody to kind of have that hand-holding process with them, and they just want to talk. So I just call them. I kind of talk to them as a, as a person of knowledge and friend and just to say, what can I do? A lot of times I meet them the day of their procedure. I go through the whole process with them. I kind of am that advocate between the doctor and the patient. And I kind of talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, kind of make them feel comfortable. I stay with them through the whole time. I meet them somewhere. I wait with them until they leave the actual procedure. I call them the next day, make sure they're okay, make sure they understand everything. And also, um, additionally, I'll call them a week after to kind of see if there's any pathology that they went through, if they have any questions with the pathology results as well. So basically our program is just showing that navigation is the process that we kind of help patients comfort them and kind of not only comfort them, but kind of bring them in and say it's not a, you know, funding is basically another thing too. So we kind of help them all over the whole process. Um, so right now we're going to start in West Philadelphia. We hope to hopefully open up a little bit more, showing the effectiveness for the first 300 patients we have the funding for. Hopefully if it goes well with West Philadelphia, we plan on going the whole entire 
Philadelphia region. So I kind of can help out right now if you're in the West Philadelphia area. And if I can help you with any other questions, even if you're not in West Philadelphia, I can kind of direct you in the right point and kind of help you out with the GI department as well. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. I'll just stay here for a moment. Thank you, Alicia. We, have, uh, we do have some time for questions. I, I just want to point out that um, this program uh, came out of, uh, you know, I think some very uh, conscientious uh, clinical research that we undertook uh, at Penn with our family, Department of Family Medicine, Internal Medicine, the gastroenterology section. We recognized that there were subsets of our patient population that had um, a frequent no-show or late cancellation for scheduled colonoscopy. So here you had uh, conscientious uh, physicians and residents who were meeting with uh, their patients advocating for um, colorectal cancer screening for average risk individuals. The patient would get scheduled for the procedure and then not show up. And you know there are a lot of reasons why this can happen. I emphasize that colorectal cancer is an equal opportunity offender. But the reality is that individuals who are challenged socioeconomically uh, bear a disproportionate burden uh, of uh, disease because of um, oftentimes a lack of access to resources. And it can be something as simple as just having someone to accompany you to the procedure. Because we use sedation it's policy that you have to leave accompanied with a um, responsible adult who's going to accompany you home so you, that you don't risk falling on your nose or uh, coming into harm's way when you may have some per, uh, 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 retained compromise in your um, psychomotor function after receiving sedation. It can be uh, simply a matter of not being able to take off from work or afraid of missing work that you'll uh, uh, come into uh, difficulty with that. Sometimes it's a matter of just not understanding the, uh, the, the preparation instructions. Um, people whose uh, first language may not be English may not have those types of resources that can assist them with that. And oftentimes uh, people who are compromised in their ambulation, uh, you know, the, the challenges in, in taking the prep, completing the prep. The biggest one I think is, is fear and this whole concept of demystifying what's involved in colonoscopy the preparation component and the actual procedure component. And so um, this uh, initiative, uh, once we, we began to explore, well, who were these patients and why weren't they uh, showing up and why did they repeatedly not show up? Uh, we, and we really then began to identify uh, some of the reasons for this. And so Alicia and her group are really pioneering this type of work in uh, ensuring that the, the otherwise disenfranchised group that may be socioeconomically challenged get the kind of uh, fair and equal uh, access to uh, medical care that we would all want for ourselves. So with that, uh, as, uh, as an asterisk, uh, do we have questions about the, uh, the Navigator program? We have several questions. Why don't we start up here and then we'll work around. If you wouldn't mind, maybe just ask your question directly to Alicia. And uh, you said you will come out to the home and uh, go through the process with you. I won't go to your home. I, I'll meet you either at Presbyterian Hospital or help or wherever you want to on the, like the campus. I'll actually give you physically the prep as well. I'll give you the Miralax, the Docalax, the Crystal Light, and I'll actually give you. Um, I made directions, kind of kind of an easier way instead of what they send you in the mail. And I'll talk to you though the whole entire process from start to finish. And we'll go over everything. We just go over a couple questions, whatever you have, and we'll talk. Or I can call you on the phone. Whatever's better for you, we'll, we'll go together. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Perhaps the young lady in the red blouse. I'm sorry. Um, when I worked at Independence of Cost in May 2009, I had a personal choice PPI. I used at University of Pennsylvania, the colorectal cancer. Um, Medical Center, I had done 2008. They said they needed it redone June 2012. I just wondered if I'd be able to use that, that program. Um, um, reason, yeah, the reason I've lost my job since 2004 healthcare costs, no longer have hardly any of those conditions, far less medications, but um, yeah, be charged eight or ten times as much 
for health insurance premium sets up we'd, we'd, do, we'd do it now without health insurance. But um, no longer have the hardly any conditions or hardly any medications. But I just wonder if I could become part of that, that thing, because I know I don't qualify for Medicaid, and I didn't come qualify, catch this as a food stamp card. Yeah, basically, I could end up in serious legal trouble. I know as a cash assistant, strictly like come up with money for overdue rent on storage locker, but I know I didn't qualify. Um, and I'm not disabled, not sick trip. I just wonder if I should, I think I should cancel Medicaid. And um, I'll be, I'll well, what we'll do is, well, actually, you and I will meet together personally today, and I'll kind of help you out because I'll give you some good direction on where we can help you out with some insurance I'm, stuff I'm, and some sorry, social worker. Another major hospital, City of Philadelphia, a friend of mine had colorectal um, ca um, cancer screening done. That hospital, she, they said it made it feel like a tractor rode through you when you when they did it. Well, thanks. I, so, so uh, uh, as Alicia indicated, um, that this, this is the value of this type of program that she can uh, make a personal connection today and and uh, address your individual uh, circumstances. We had a question over here from the Living the Power. Hi, um, I just want to know if your program is on OncoLink. So, is there material that we can take with us, or is OncoLink also linked to you? I think Uncle Lick today will link me to them, but actually we can go to the Penn Medicine website and you'll see us on there as well. And then I have some cards with me and I have some flyers as well. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Alicia. Well, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Anil Rusky. Uh, Dr. Rusky is the T. Greer Miller Professor of Medicine Genetics. Uh, he is the chief of the Division of Gastroenterology at Penn. He is a uh, internationally renowned uh, uh, investigator and clinician. Uh, he is our fearless leader, and he is uh, in now the ascendancy to become the president of the American Gastroenterology Association, and this is having served as editor for its journal, Gastroenterology. Uh, he is a um, uh, NIH-funded uh, uh, researcher, his research um, uh, focuses on uh, the mechanisms of, of colorectal cancer uh, development, and um, uh, he's uh, such a a, um, um, a, a multi-talented uh, uh, guy that he's just uh, come over from the pancreatic section, and uh, so he's going to be talking about managing uh, high-risk patients. Thank you, Anil. There are only two people who praise me this much with their generous remarks. That's uh, Dr. Ginsburg and my mother. So, uh, uh, and and I I uh, obey them in that order too. <laughs> okay. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, really excited to be here. This has been uh, part of a uh, annual event uh, for the last five years or so, and we really look forward to it and uh, uh, meeting with you. I'll say at the outset, uh, one of the things uh, that's inevitable is that questions and uh, even concerns come up after the conference, if you're like me and thinking about it afterwards. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, call me, uh, email me if, uh, if I can help out, and, and that uh, with my colleagues as well. So there are many, many aspects of colorectal cancer. And um, you're hearing a lot about uh, how we can prevent. Um, uh, certainly, uh, dietary uh, factors are important in terms of uh, a low-fat diet uh, and exercise. That's been established through uh, large population-based studies. Um, certainly, uh, there, there's much uh, uh, research uh, that's indicated that chemo prevention is important as well, meaning is there something I can take, a magic pill, if you will? And to that end, it's, it's clear that uh, aspirin is helpful, um, including a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. It's clear that multivitamin is helpful. You may hear about calcium. It's not clear if that, that's helpful. Um, there was much publicity uh, about seven or eight years ago of using cel the coccyps, the celecoxib and rofecoxib. Unfortunately, those studies became very, very complicated. Um, and as a result, 
it's not clear if, if we can use that class of drugs or not. Um, you've heard and will continue to hear how we diagnose the precursor lesions and polyps, especially through Dr. Ginsburg's work. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about once polyps are diagnosed and detected and cancers detected, what's the outcome and what, what, how can we manage it. So when we think about the risk factors for uh, colorectal cancer, um, certainly it's uh, age-related. So uh, as we get older into our 60s and 70s, our risk increases. The average risk uh, patient is defined as someone um, who's over the age of 50 without a personal or family history of colon cancer, who has a lifetime risk of about 5 or 6 percent of developing colon cancer, which is um, related to our dietary and lifestyle factors. We know that having a personal history of adenoma or a family history of colorectal cancer or a very strong, strong family history of colorectal cancer increases that lifetime risk from 5 to 6 percent all the way up to about 20 percent and even in some situations 80 or 90 or 100 percent. So I'd like to dwell a little bit about you know, when it increases to 20% all the way up to 100%. So Dr. Ginsburg went through this already, but this, I just want to use this as a, as a point of comparison in that the average risk patient that I just told you about, age 50 or more, male or female, um, it's recommended to do a screening colonoscopy. There are alternative approaches, but it seems like right now that's the most sensitive and specific and if that baseline colonoscopy is normal or negative, it's a good exam, don't need to have it repeated for another 10 years. And if a polyp is found, you have to see what kind of polyp it is, because if it's something called hyperplastic polyp, it really should be viewed as a normal colonoscopy, don't need to repeat the colonoscopy for 10 years. And if there's an adenomatous polyp or polyps, a subset of these polyps over time may develop into cancer if left alone, and that means since we cannot tell which polyp or polyps may develop into cancer, then we have to come back with a colonoscopy sooner rather than later, and that sooner is generally three years, but it could be a little bit sooner than that, again, depending upon the number and size of the polyps. So that risk then is increased in individuals if there's a personal or family history of lots of polyps, and in these situations, then the colonoscopy should be done in at-risk individuals every three to five years. Starting generally between the ages of 40 to 50, there is a lot of variability, and it's best to discuss the, the details of this with your physician. And if there's a, a strong family history of colorectal cancer, that's not the syndromes that we'll talk about, the colonoscopy should be 10 years younger than the youngest case, or what's called the index case in the family. So I mentioned again, average risk, life, individual lifetime risk is 5 to 6 percent. But if there's some family history, meaning a first degree relative, a first degree relative is a parent, a sibling, or a child, or a second degree relative, meaning grandparent, uncle, aunt, first cousin, that risk starts to increase depending upon the number of first degree and or second degree relatives involved, and that risk goes from about 5 or 6 percent now to almost 20 percent. Does that make sense to everybody? And so that risk increases even more if we have what are called syndromes in which there's a lot of colon cancer and it occurs very early in life. And we often refer to this as hereditary colorectal cancer. So the average risk individual in which polyps and cancer occur just sort of randomly or seemingly randomly, they constitute about 70 percent of all colon cancers every year. The familial cases, in which I mentioned there's some first degree and or second degree relative involved, that represents actually a high number, about 10 to 30 percent every year. 
And then the hereditary syndromes represent about 5% of cases every year. So the first hereditary syndrome I'd like to mention for your uh, consideration is called familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. And here, these individuals, in a shocking sort of way, develop hundreds to thousands of adenomatous polyps, the same type of polyp that we see in the average risk, but multiplied by many, many. And they develop these polyps in their teens and 20s. And unless the, the, the colon is removed by surgery, unfortunately, these patients are fated to develop colon cancer 100% of the time. So once we identify these individuals, we don't have to intervene with surgery immediately. We can defer that surgery till generally into their 20s, at which point they get a, a surgery called total abdominal colectomy and internal connection. These patients are also at increased risk for different types of cancers beyond the colon or outside the colon, including in the stomach, or just a little bit beyond the stomach and the small intestine, the first part of the small intestine that's called the duodenum, and also the thyroid gland, occasionally the brain. Um, and they can also have benign lesions, not cancerous lesions, in the skin, the teeth, and, and the bone. And so to, uh, to that end, um, one condition that can be appreciated by the physician or the ophthalmologist is looking in the back of the eye and looking for that little black oval disc there that is a good marker that the FAP will develop if, if FAP is present in the family because this condition can also be found outside of FAP. So we use this actually as a little screening tool in kids before uh, kids start getting colonoscopy. It just helps uh, plan. So here's a surgical specimen in the top left-hand corner um, filled with polyps. And we can take those polyps and look at them under the microscope with our pathology colleague. And it sort of has a mushroom appearance, a stalk with a mushroom head on it. That's what a polyp looks like under the microscope. So the gene that is responsible for FAP early in life is called APC. And I don't want you really dwell on sort of the, the, the science of this, but just a couple of take home points. It's a big gene and changes can occur in the basis, the code uh, of the gene and, and a, a single change can cause um, FAP. And we have the ability to read through this gene using molecular tools and identify where the change is. And if the change is found in a given individual, then we can offer to the at-risk family members the ability to look for that same gene in siblings and children and extended family members. So here's a, a typical uh, family tree, and my colleague Jill Stouffer will talk about this in much more uh, detail, but as you look at this family pedigree or tree, um, uh, males are squares, uh, which is often the case, I'm told. Um, um, females are circles, and what you see in the top is um, the, the generation of the grandparents. It turns out grandfather had colon cancer and unfortunately died at age 45. Often that happens in preceding generations. We just don't have either the personal recall or, or collective family recall, or we just don't have the medical records. But we have a sense of what it was. And in the next generation, um, the, the mother died, had FAP and unfortunately died of colon cancer at age 31, but a, but a sibling, a sister, had FAP at 22, but it was recognized that she had FAP and underwent the appropriate therapy, surgery. And now, 
where the arrow is the patient who came to see us had FAP diagnosed a little bit later at 38, actually got the genetic testing, was found to have the change in the APC gene, and could then offer that to the two children. A daughter at age 16 was found to have the gene change. A son at age 14 was not found. So that means now with the daughter, we've got to follow her closely with regular colonoscopies and other measures and plan for the eventual surgery. But the son is not going to get FAP and can be average risk and wait till age 50, as far as we know now. Um, to get screening colonoscopy. So this is a nice illustration of using genetic testing and genetic counseling to influence clinical practice in the extended family. And this is what we do on a regular basis. There's a variant of FAP that's called attenuated, meaning diminished. In other words, you don't see as many, many polyps. Um, and this occurs later in life. People are typically in their 50s, sometimes their 60s. They don't have hundreds to thousands of polyps. They might have up to 100, uh, perhaps 20, 30. And they, too, have a change in the APC gene. These are patients that will often discover by accident at the time of screening colonoscopy for an average risk. We see lots of polyps. We come back with the follow-up colonoscopy. We see lots of polyps again. And at that point, we start wondering, well, could this be a variant of FAP? Does that make sense? And so this is a summary of what we do. If we have a family member or a family where we see that there's lots of polyps over 100, or if we have a situation where it's attenuated FAP, we for, for sure recommend genetic testing for APC. If we find evidence of the APC gene change, then we offer that to other family members to get genetic testing. On a clinical level, Someone who has FAP gets regular colonoscopies actually every year till, till surgery. They also get an upper endoscopy to look for polyps that can occur in the stomach or small intestine. They also get a um, thyroid ultrasound every year because 5 to 10 percent of these patients can develop thyroid cancer. And they get a good exam of the skin and teeth because there can be abnormalities there. So, what, what's happened is that with the discovery of the APC gene being responsible for FAP, it turns out that in the average risk adenomatous polyp in the general population, that about 70 to 80 percent of the time, the same APC gene is found in the adenomatous polyp. So it shows you that the, that the basis for FAP has had important um, implications and led to new insights into how polyps develop in the average risk individual. There's a related condition to attenuated FAP, and this is a, a very busy slide, but the take home points are that um, adults like attenuated FAP can have somewhat of a related co a condition where they develop a fair number of polyps, but it's due to a gene called MYH. And, um, uh, uh, th it typically occurs in the 50s and 60s, and they may also have increased cancer risk outside the colon. And so when we discovered these individuals who have a tendency to form polyps in their mid-age, um, we then pursued genetic testing looking not only for the APC gene, and if that's okay, it automatically looks for changes in the MYH gene. And the next and last condition that's under hereditary colon cancer is called Lynch. And here, what you can see is up to about 100 adenomatous polyps or adenomas. They're typically tiny or flat, just a few millimeters sometimes. So a lot more than the average risk, but not as many as FAP, somewhere in between. And these patients will typically develop their polyps in their 40s, sometimes later, sometimes earlier. So onset of polyps is later than FAP, but earlier than average risk, and probably earlier than attenuated FAP or MYH. Typically, the, the polyps 
are seen in, in the right colon, although not exclusively so. And um, these polyps, if left alone, can develop into colon cancer, and the mean age of colon cancer is about 45. And these individuals can also have cancers develop outside the colon, and that includes into the stomach, the bile duct, which comes out of the gallbladder, the small bowel, which connects the stomach to the colon, the kidney, maybe the pancreas, and in women in particular, uh, the uterus or endometrium and ovary. Okay? So in these individuals, the lifetime risk of colon cancer is about 80%. Again, average risk is 5 to 6%. FAP is 100%. The lifetime risk of endometrial cancer is about a little over 40%. Lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is probably up to 10%. And all the others I've shown you is somewhere on the order of a few percent to 10%. So huge, 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 huge risk. So there are criteria, and this is in its simplest form, of how to categorize these Lynch uh, families. Three or more relatives with colorectal cancer one case being a first degree relative of the other two, spanning two generations, one case before age 50. And so there are multiple genes that are responsible for Lynch. And if we look at, remember the original pie diagram, I showed you that maybe four to five percent of colon cancers are due to HNPCC or Lynch. And if you look at those families, um, they're, they're different genes are altered or changed with different frequency. So if we suspect it, then we can use tools to look for those changes, just like a, the same approach that I mentioned in FAP. Sometimes the at Lynch families can have skin tumors, and just has a, an unusual name named after the people who identified it, Muir Torre, and we actually are seeing a number of these families, apart from seeing a lot of Lynch families, and the two skin tumors are, are somewhat unique and typically found uh, in the upper chest, uh, in the arms, and especially in the face uh, around the nose. And these patients in particular, we work very closely with our dermatology colleagues because they have to be seen by our dermatologists almost every uh, three to four to six months. So here's a situation, again, integrating this genetic testing knowledge with uh, clinical practice. The arrow points to a woman who came to us at that time, age 43. She had unfortunately been diagnosed with um, rectal uh, cancer. And um, she was referred to us uh, as to, well, what should the therapy be? Because the family showed a lot of cancers on the dad's side with stomach cancer, endometrial cancer, colon cancer. Dad himself had kidney cancer. What to do? So we suspected Lynch here. And we got the genetic testing done, and she came back with a change in one of the genes that's responsible for Lynch. And armed with that information, it actually influenced the type of surgery that she got. She got a much more extensive colon surgery had she, quotation marks, just had rectal cancer as average risk. And because she had finished childbearing, um, and because she has an increased risk for endometrial and ovarian cancer, we discussed and she agreed to getting her, her hysterectomy and oophorectomies. And, and she's really doing great now. And her siblings came in to get genetic testing as well. So when we suspect Lynch, sometimes we'll go proceed straight to genetic testing. Sometimes it's not clear that they have Lynch, but we sort of suspect it but no, don't know what to do. And so we'll obtain with informed consent the tissue, the colon cancer tissue on a given family member or that patient, if that patient has colon cancer. And we can work with our pathologist to look for changes that might sus uh, suspect Lynch. And if those changes are occurring in the colon cancer tissue, we'll feel, we'll feel more confident about pursuing genetic testing in that individual. If those changes are not present in the colon cancer tissue, then we'll say, well, maybe we should hold off on the genetic testing 
And we should monitor you closely, for instance, through periodic colonoscopies. And if the genetic testing comes back positive, we know it's Lynch. If it comes back negative, we know it's not Lynch. Maybe it's something related to Lynch, but we just don't know the genes that cause that for the time being. So currently what we do in Lynch is that for somebody at risk, we start with colonoscopy between the ages of 20 to 25, actually do it every two years until age 40, every year after age 40. If the family shows stomach cancer, we'll recommend periodic upper endoscopies. For endometrial cancer risk, we'll recommend using an ultrasound to look at the ovaries and to take snippets of tissues from the lining of the endometrium and do this annually starting between the ages of 25 to 35. And some places, because of the risk of bladder cancer, suggest collecting the urine to look for cancerous cells on an annual basis. And if the gene responsible for Lynch is found, we'll have discussions with our patients and families about removing essentially all the colon and rehooking internally. And as I mentioned, the patient uh, with the genetic testing finished childbearing to, to, to discuss and pursue hysterectomy and taking out both ovaries or ovarectomies. Remembering that surgery then removes the risk in the tissue or that, was re that was taken out, but it doesn't remove the risk of cancer in the tissues that are left behind. So it turns out that if you look at the average risk individual, maybe an adenomatous polyp will take five to 10 years to develop, and maybe 5% of those polyps left alone will go on to cancer. That takes a long time. FAP, actually, even though I said it's hundreds of thousands of polyps, left alone, the cancer actually can take a couple of decades. That's why we're able to defer the surgery. But it turns out in Lynch, for reasons that are a little bit uh, unusual, patients develop polyps, but if they're left alone, they can do develop into cancer within one, two, or three years. So that's why we have to do colonoscopy on a regular basis uh, in these individuals and often pursue surgery. A couple of other conditions that we see quite a bit of. First is in kids and adolescents, what's called poitz jagger syndrome. Big polyps that are present in the small intestine and or colon. The big polyps can bleed um, or sometimes even obstruct the flow. So in either case, they might have to go to surgery. Uh, the gene is known for this. Genetic testing is available so we can advise uh, family members. And as these patients live longer into their 30s, 40s, and 50s, it turns out apart, having, apart from having an increased risk of colon cancer, they develop increased risk for a lot of other cancers including pancreas cancer uh, that we see uh, as well. Another condition is called Cowden syndrome. Um, unusual skin lesions uh, that can be present on the hands or on the face, um, can biopsy, that our pathologist can tell us what it is. And these patients have increased risk of colorectal cancer, but also a number of other cancers, especially breast and thyroid. Genetic testing is available here as well. Third condition that we see in, uh, uh, that's rare, as seeing in the adolescents and young adults, is called juvenile polyposis. Big polyps, much like poitz jagers big polyps can bleed or obstruct, um, need a certain number, increased risk of colon cancer, and genetic testing is available as well. So we can suspect these conditions based on family history but also sort of what the polyp looks like at the time of colonoscopy, but especially what it looks like under the uh, light microscope. So I mentioned to you at the outset that 10 to 20 percent of colon cancers have some familial basis, increased risk up to 20 percent, lifetime risk of colon cancer. We don't know what the gene or genes that are responsible, but this is an area of much investigation and active investigation. So hopefully 
new types of information will be emerging in the years uh, uh, to come. You know, given the complexity, we have a, a population of 300 million, um, and the compliance with screening colonoscopy is much better. So now, probably over 60% who are eligible for screening colonoscopy do comply with it, in contrast to about 25, 30% about nine, 10 years ago. So that's a huge improvement. The incidence of colon cancer is declining, as you've heard, but is there something that we can do that's even broader and gets to everybody? And so there's a lot of research going on that could we identify some blood test, in a blood test, some marker that would say, okay, um, uh, you are low risk and maybe you only need a one-time colonoscopy, maybe you don't need a colonoscopy and you, per, you do prevention through good diet, good exercise, a baby aspirin. In contrast, can we develop blood tests that identify those people who are actually at increased risk apart from their family history and if the family history suggests it then we pursue genetic testing still do prevention and chemo prevention but in these individuals we do colonoscopy on a on a very regular basis I'll leave you with that because that's something that people are thinking about a lot as we rightfully struggle to try to apply screening colonoscopy to everyone possible so thank you for your attention and look forward to the panel discussion. I think um, clearly Dr. Wesky's presentation evokes uh, the impact that gen genetic and molecular bi biology research have had on uh, empowering real tangible uh, clinical disease testing and, and decision uh, management. Uh, we'll take a few moments for questions. One, one question that preceded your arrival, Anil, was um, I wonder if you were able to make some comments on what some of the theories are pertaining to the, the shift in uh, precancerous uh, lesions from the left side of the colon to the right side of the colon and changes in morphology from pedunculated to flattened sessile lesions. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and I, I scratch my head about this a lot. Um, there are a couple of comments about this. Um, the first is that some of it possibly uh, may be related to our enhanced ability to detect polyps um, through improved technology in the right colon. So there could be this detection bias in a good way. The second is that there may be some ethnicity differences as well. By that I mean that it appears that African Americans have a greater likelihood to right colon polyps and right colon cancer than Caucasian Americans. We don't know the basis for that. The third could be that shifting dietary and lifestyle factors have somehow made changes in the colon environment that are predisposing to more polyps and flatter polyps um, in the right colon. And it turns out these subset of flat polyps can have some of the genetic changes that I've alluded to and some other genetic changes. So in the right colon cancers, we work very closely with our pathology colleagues, assuming it's not FAP or Lynch, to look at the tissue to look for certain changes that might predict for a certain pathway as well. So I think it's a combination of, uh, of all those reasons. Thank you. We have a question over here. Oh, question here and then uh, to the blue table. Thank you. Uh, you spoke of the extracolonic tumor. Yeah. Could you speak a little further about that? Because my husband has one that's on his colon but on the outside and we went and uh, I just don't know what he should be doing about that. Sure. If it's in the context of um, FAP, uh, work with us um, and to screen like the thyroid gland, the stomach. My, my colleague, Dr. Ginsburg's expert in this, especially in looking 
at these unusual polyps in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, and the opening of the pancreas, what's called the ampulla. Those are the ones that we worry about the most. We worry even more, if that's possible to worry even more, in Lynch, where cancers can develop outside the colon. By extracolonic, I mean outside the colon. Not necessarily that the original colon cancer has spread to other uh, organs. And here, in women, it's the uterus and the ovary. And in men, as well as women, it's the stomach, the small bowel or small intestine, the bile duct that comes out of the gallbladder, um, maybe the pancreas, uh, the kidney and the bladder. So in some of these situations, we have clinical tools to look for them, and in other situations, we don't. So this, this is a, a recurring theme type question. To be explicit, these are primary cancers of those other organ systems arising from that cellular material, not colon cancer arising from the pancreas, as example. Right. Question here? Hi, uh, yes. I'm, um, my wife and I traveled up from Virginia. She's a uh, Lynch syndrome survivor and previvor. Uh, she had diagnosed in 2008 Lynch syndrome, and, and Dr. Timmerman in Richmond, Virginia, uh, did the colectomy and a complete hysterectomy and removed her uh, lower, um, I want to say adenoids, but that's not right, lymph nodes. Um, so she's had that treatment since then and, and during the cancer. She also, uh, her adrenal glands shut down. So it's complicated by uh, Addison's disease and subsequently in the last year has been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. All three being um, different forms of uh, immune issues. The question would be, are, are these is there any study that shows how these may or may not be related? Yeah. And um, what the, the, the difficulty we're having is finding treatment to treat her as a whole, whereas the treatment for arthritis may be taking steroids, but the steroids aggravate your dietary issues when you don't have a colon. And, and we're, have, uh, we're willing to travel across the nation to find somebody that would treat her as a whole. And then also, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, contact you by email or phone number and never put that out. Um, and, and our son has been, has been screened. But uh, one other question about that is, is um, the community, the medical community and the insurance community coming together um, to us, it seems, you know, we're afraid to have his results tell us he is indeed Lynch because then we're going to have, will he be insurable getting jobs and, and insurance on his own as a young adult? And, and I got a lot of other questions, but I'll hold sure. them for later. No, thank you so much, and I'm, I, I hope you're feeling better, um, and thanks for coming up from Virginia. My direct number is the following. Operators are on standby. 215-898-0154. Uh, I will get back to you nighttime weekends. I will we'll do that. 215-898-0154. Leave a message and I'll get back to you. My email is extremely long, but we'll get that to you. Um, in terms of issues surrounding insurance, confidentiality, the potential for discrimination with your son, um, I'm going to let my colleague Jill Stouffer talk about that, and she'll clarify that elegantly for you. Um, we d we're not aware of overlap and intersection, if you will, between Lynch syndrome and autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, adrenal insufficiency in this country tends to be um, unusual. Um, and it can be due to uh, medications. So sometimes if people are on steroids for a long time and then the steroids are stopped abruptly, there can be problems with the adrenal gland function. 
Um, sometimes tumors can spread to the adrenal tumor, uh, adrenal gland. Typically doesn't cause adrenal insufficiency. The adrenal gland is not part of Lynch syndrome. Um, so I'm not sure the reason for the adrenal insufficiency. Um, sometimes really bad infection can do it. In other countries like tuberculosis. So I'd have to learn a little bit more about that to uh, 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 answer that better. But that being said, I agree with you, a, a, a sort of a holistic approach is necessary to put all these seemingly disparate pieces together. And I can help guide you on that, whether it's in Virginia or in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. So we're here to help you with that. Thank you, Anil. OK, thank you very much. brief panel discussion at conclusion, and, and I've been handed a question. I think we'll, we'll take that question during the panel. Um, so our last uh, um, um, organized uh, speaker this morning is, is Jill Soffer, uh, who Anil alluded to. Uh, Jill is a uh, certified genetic counselor, and she's uh, part of our cancer uh, risk evaluation program. And uh, Jill is going to speak on the topic of talking about risk and implications for your family. Very appropriate to the previous question. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out. Uh, it sounds like some of uh, you out there have personal histories, and some of you may be here uh, not because you were diagnosed yourself, but perhaps have family histories. and. Um, an overarching theme I'm going to cover in this presentation is how important uh, a role you can play uh, by sharing your personal story with your family, uh, sharing information about your diagnosis uh, throughout the family, that it can be really uh, powerful in helping to protect your relatives. Sometimes this means your, your siblings, your brothers, your sisters, sometimes it's your children. Um, as a genetic counselor in the cancer center and division of gastroenterology, uh, we work with families. Um, and a genetic evaluation is a family evaluation. So here's a beautiful family. And uh, perhaps here in this family, the, the dad has a personal history of colon cancer. And there are lots of things for this dad to focus on uh, in regard to his own treatment. But one of the things that's going through his head uh, and one of the things that may have gone through your mind if you're a personal uh, survivor of colon cancer is, what about my kids? Uh, what's going to happen to them? Is this something that they need to uh, take special measures for? If so, at what age? What do they need to do? And the good news is that if the next generation or the current generation knows about the history of colon cancer in the family, there are lots of things to do. It really depends on why the person developed their cancer in the first place. In the genetics clinic, we take very, very detailed uh, family history information. But family history is important uh, to share, even if you never make it into a genetics clinic, even if um, you're just going through the usual uh, process as a, as a cancer patient, to know about your family history and to share that information with your doctor is extremely important. And we'll go through some of the specifics of that. Um, we know that uh, uh, family history may guide a whole bunch of issues. It may guide uh, screening recommendations that your doctor offers to you. And the family history information typically includes who in your family has had what type of cancer, or do you know about any history of polyps? Um, I'll be honest, not a lot of us know about our relative's history of polyps. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, but if there's reason to suspect that there may be a hereditary condition in your family or a strong uh, inherited risk for colon cancer in your family, you can get to that information eventually. And it really may be helpful in figuring out uh, what people need to do, because it may not be what the average person is doing. And the goal with knowing your family history information is to try to get the best recommendations for you, for your relatives, and that may or may not resemble what the average person is doing. But without the family history information, you're kind of in the dark. And then the best that can be offered is what you would do in the standard quote unquote situation. 
So sharing the information is really important. We're aware of a, a fairly astounding statistic that among um, people who have colon cancer, a full third of their close relatives, first degree relatives, are not even aware of that fact. Um, for whatever reason, it's less uh, common for people to share their story about having colon cancer than some other cancers, let's say breast cancer or um, other, other uh, medical issues. And why that may be, it, you know, it may be that some people find that uh, sharing information about colon cancer is embarrassing. Um, it may be that uh, for some people who are a, a certain generation, the, the guide that they've always followed is um, I don't share my personal medical story with my family members. I don't want them to worry about me. I'm going to take this on on my own and I'm going to be educated. I'm going to take care of myself, but I'm not going to place a burden on my relatives and, and let it become their problem. And these are honorable motives, of course, but what we're learning now more and more is that the best thing that you can do to help your relatives that you care so much about or hopefully at least some of them, um, is that you can tell them about it. Tell them about it, tell them about your personal diagnosis, and we'll go through some of, some of the strategies that you can use to share it, but um, it can help guide screening recommendations. It can lead to the diagnosis of one of these hereditary cancer conditions that Dr. Rustigi talked about. Sometimes if we get enough detail about the family history together, it does suggest that there may be genetic testing opportunities that could be really helpful for your family. And with the genetic testing, you have a very powerful way to sort into the right category who maybe needs to start screening at a very young age and more frequently, and then who doesn't need to do that, for whom it's, it's really overkill. So um, sharing your family history may lead to potentially life-saving interventions. Um, and the type of information that's important for families to talk about with one another are, again, what, what type of cancer uh, did, did you have? Uh, so was it colon cancer or uh, was it another type of cancer? Sometimes in a family, the information can get a little bit mixed up if a cancer spread to a particular place. Sometimes the, 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 the family story is, well, so-and-so had liver cancer, but did it start in the liver or did it start somewhere else and eventually spread? So that might be a helpful follow-up question. Did your cancer start there or was that a place that it, it traveled to? So what type of cancer is present and also, what is the age at which that cancer developed? Maybe your prior generation in your family had cancer and you're interested in sharing this information with your children so they can discuss it with their doctors. So we want to know the type of cancer and even the approximate age that the relative was diagnosed. Sometimes we just don't know exactly how old grandma was, but was she in her 60s when she got her cancer? Was she in her 30s? Even if you can narrow it down to a, a decade of life, that can be really helpful for your doctors in thinking about what, what might this be. Um, some people just are private about their uh, medical situations, and that's understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. And so the, the thought about sharing this information can be overwhelming and feel uncomfortable. Um, just know that even if you share this information, you need not share every detail of your medical story with the relatives. Just because uh, you had a cancer doesn't mean that now I, I have to sit down and, and go through the whole thing and, and here's the treatment that I had and this is how I felt and these were my side effects. And just the thought of doing that can be very overwhelming. And just know you don't need to do that. You don't need to share any more than you really feel comfortable doing. Just saying, um, these are the people, myself, and these are the other people I know who've had cancer and they got it about this age, that's really the core um, of helpful information. If you're not comfortable talking about other details, then there's really no reason uh, to do that. Um, sometimes when we do genetic testing in a family and there is genetic risk identified, it can be a little bit of a daunting thing. Genetics can be complicated and uh, sometimes people worry, gosh, it's just so overwhelming, it's so complicated, I don't know that I can even knowledgeably discuss this in a way with my relatives. And just to say, it's not important that you know every little detail about what DNA is and, and all of that. Of course, we do our best to make you experts as well in this, 
But again, the core is if there's genetic risk in the family to discuss it, if there's family history in, in the family to discuss it, even in its bare bone detail and not worry about all the nuances. Um, knowledge about the family history of cancer can make things better. Um, it was pointed out, um, and I'm saying it again, there is special screening that's available. Um, sometimes people get fatalistic and they think, well, you know, there's this cancer in the family, I'm just gonna get it one day, uh, and, and there's kind of a, a sense of, of doom. And I wanna <coughs> emphasize that that's really, really not the case. The more information you have, the more opportunities you have to make things better for yourself and your family. And when we can engage a family through the genetic counseling and testing process, some people in the family will actually discover that despite the fact that there might be a strong family history, they did not inherit what we know to be the source of cancer risk in the family. And what a blessing and a gift to be able to give someone that information. Uh, when there's a, a more profound history, you know, no doubt people are worried about it. And to be able to get out from under that history through informative genetic testing can be uh, a true gift too. Uh, there are ways to lower cancer risk. Um, it's not something that everyone has to have. You've heard lots about the merits of colonoscopy screening. Um, it's wonderful screening. And there aren't that many cancers for which we have such an effective opportunity to go in, get the polyp, don't get the cancer. Um, and some people worry so much about their family history of cancer that they just can't get themselves to, to take action. Um, and or sometimes there's genetic risk in the family and someone's worried about genetic testing and, and they just can't make themselves go and uh, be part of the process. And not knowing about the fact that there is this uh, increased risk in the family or there is genetic risk in the family, it, it doesn't mean it's not there, it just means you don't know about it and you're not taking any action that might protect yourself. Um, sometimes it's a process. It's not uncommon for us to work with a family that has genetic risk and relatives maybe now have been informed about the fact that this is present. And not everyone races out and makes the phone call right away. Sometimes it's a, it's a process. You have to think about it and, and be prepared and take action. And, and that's okay. Um, we recognize and understand that all of this can be scary. Um, but just know that you're not alone. There are other people there who can help guide you through this process. So in talking to the family, I've uh, listed three particular scenarios that we deal with a lot when we engage a family in our genetics clinic and we've gone through a, a genetic evaluation um, and we've done genetic testing. Um, but before I go through these scenarios, I, again, the most common scenario is there's been no genetic testing, but there is family history and that remains the key, just talking about your family history with your relatives. But let's say there has been genetic testing. For example, there's a, a Lynch syndrome in the family. Um, and let's say that there's been a gene mutation found. Uh, what are some strategies here? There's a, a common scenario where maybe your doctor has suggested that a genetic evaluation take place and genetic testing has, um, has proceeded, but yet there's no gene mutation identified. That's also fairly common because genetic testing has not caught up to the source of risk uh, in every family. We don't have a monolithic test or one test that we can administer to families and say, um, there is one gene we can test you for all inherited colon cancer risk, or there's one gene we can test you for for all uh, uterine cancer risk. Uh, there are many genes that we have in our toolbox that we can check at the moment, and there'll be many more down the road in the future. So some families, uh, by our assessment, will look through the, the history and the family tree and will say, it really looks suspicious. It, it looks like there's something there. there. There's more cancer than we think uh, that would be present that just due to chance alone, but we don't yet have a gene that we can uh, point to and say, and it's because of that gene. So we'll talk about that scenario. And then we'll talk about scenario three, which is when genetic testing results are not clear cut. So in, a, in the situation where your family's been through genetic testing um, and there is a gene mutation in the family, who do you tell? Who is it important to tell? Well, well, most people get it that I need to tell my siblings and I need to tell my kids, but are there other people in the family who might benefit from it? Well, one of the things that uh, is the job of a genetic counselor to do is to help you figure out who that is, but often the information is relevant to those beyond just your children and your siblings 
It can be relevant to uh, aunts and uncles and cousins. And sometimes as you go out through the family tree and you're talking about people who are less closely related to you, they may actually be the people who need the, the bigger heads up uh, because they may be at risk for having this also, but because they're not as close in relatedness to uh, you or the person who's had cancer, they may not be as familiar with uh, this condition, they may never have heard of it, they may be unaware of all what's going on in the family, and they really may not be doing anything special uh, in regard to their follow-up. So in a family, if there are other people who have related forms of cancer, so obviously if there are other people with colon cancer and the condition is Lynch, then they need to be um, uh, told. And, and we get it that sometimes it's, it's tricky. Um, when to tell people about it, um, honestly, we say as soon as you feel ready, and that can be right away. It can be when you receive the information um, within the next week. It may be that you feel you're able to now share the information. Um, and, and how do you go about doing it? it? It can seem daunting to have to figure out a way to contact your relatives and say, hey, guess what? There's, there's genetic risk for cancer in the family. Um, so, so what are some of the steps you can think about um, in how you want to present this information to your relatives? Well, a good place to start is, is kind of what we typically do uh, with families is we first start to talk about well, what do you know about this? And then you kind of know where to go with the conversation. Maybe in your family there's been lots of uh, digging for information and it's been a joint effort and, and some family members are already fairly sophisticated about this. But Maybe you mention this to your relative and, and you say, have you ever heard of this condition, Lynch syndrome, or have you ever heard of this condition, familial polyposis, and you know, no. Uh, that, that person is really starting from um, a, a position of, of, of very limited knowledge. Then you kind of know where to go from there. Um, you can just say it straight out. Uh, I have had genetic testing and I've been found to have a genetic risk. And in the same breath, we like to emphasize, and this is something you can do with your relatives too, um, but there's something you can do about it. And the reason that I'm sharing this information with you is that I want you to have this information so that you can improve your own odds of staying healthy. Um, and, and that really can be the, the crux of, of what you say. Uh, you can tailor the information to your relatives. You don't have to have a standard message. Um, certainly, sometimes what you sh are going to share with uh, uh, older relatives may be different from what you're sharing with uh, a younger relative who is um, in college and taking some science coursework and has some you know, more detailed questions. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. You can tailor the conversation. Again, you don't have to share every detail of your personal story. You can talk about the things that you're comfortable with. And you can also help your relatives sort out what are next steps. And next steps may be talking to an expert who knows about this. You don't have to figure out what your relative needs to do in regard to his or own medical care. Typically, the next steps are figuring out who can that person see to get their own personal guidance about you know, what, what should happen next. Um, another very key important thing, if you have had genetic risk identified for you personally, is to know that your relative will need a copy of your lab report from your genetic testing in order to know how to be tested appropriately. Um, you can think of genetic testing kind of like a big spell checking process. You're looking for spelling errors in an enormous book. So think War and Peace, think a really big book. And genetic testing is kind of like saying on any page of this book, there could be a misspelling. It could be many words are garbled or misspelled. It could be whole sentences are, are um, misspelled. Or it could be as simple as one letter and one word is flipped for another. When a mutation uh, has been found, it's like knowing exactly what page of the book, exactly where that spelling error is. And then for everyone else in the family, all you need to do is go to that particular place uh, to find out whether or not you also share this genetic risk. It makes testing much less expensive, much uh, simpler, and, and it makes it very informative. So the bottom line is if you've had genetic risk identified, your relative needs a copy of your lab report in order to know how to proceed appropriately and for the people working with your relative to know how to properly order the test. Keep your lab report in a safe place. Um, another question that comes up in our clinic all the time is, 
what's a good age for relatives to be tested if there is genetic risk in the family? Um, should we be targeting all you know, little, little people or teenagers or young adults? You know, what's the age at which um, it, it makes sense to test the next generation? And often people are concerned uh, very deeply and understandably about their kids. There's an overarching theme that we turn to in thinking about that question, and that is, what age is it that that um, person uh, needs to receive this information in order to make informed medical decisions? And if it's a child, that child's you know, doctor, at what age does that uh, child need to have the information because their medical care might change? And it really varies depending on what the condition is. So there's no one answer. Um, so for the condition familial polyposis that Dr. Rustigi discussed, typically a, a touch point is at around the ages of between 10 and 12, you're going to start doing screening colonoscopies for young people if you know they have this condition. So that's a reasonable age at which to be tested for that condition. Um, if they don't carry that particular gene, then you can spare them colonoscopy screening for a lot of years. Then they don't need to be uh, screened until they're about the age of 50 in the absence of symptoms. So it's a, it's a major touch point. If you're talking about a condition like Lynch syndrome, where we don't see any impact in children, uh, then uh, the screening usually begins between the ages of about 20 and 25. So testing young adults makes sense. But is there any point in, in testing a, a child? Uh, we would argue no that this information can really bring a fair amount of anxiety uh, to the table if you know that you're at increased risk. And if it comes with an action plan, then that anxiety can be dealt with and ameliorated and you feel empowered to, to go ahead. But if it's just information about cancer risk in your child but there's nothing to do about it, we would argue that maybe it's not a great idea. So in general, we just think about that question. At what age are medical decisions affected? And that's a great age to consider testing. I will just say here that genetic testing results are not always straightforward. And we see a lot of people who are tested in the community who unfortunately don't always get the right information because um, you would think it's, just, it's, it's positive or negative, right? You have genetic risk or you don't. And, and unfortunately, it's just not always straightforward. The only situation where someone is what we call a true negative is when genetic testing has been identified in, in someone else. Um, a negative is not always negative. So let's say, for example, we are working with a family and there's three sisters who've had colon cancer. And all of the colon cancer was diagnosed before the age of 50. So we would say, you know what, this is a family that looks suspicious for something. We really suspect there's something going on that's making uh, these sisters at higher risk. But um, uh, possibly one sister's gone through genetic testing and maybe even two and nothing has shown up. Um, and then maybe there's a brother who says to himself, well, I have got three sisters with, with colon cancer. I'm going to go get genetic testing too. And in that situation, we'd say, you know, in your family, nothing has shown up with the genetic testing, and your negative result doesn't mean anything. We think there's something there, but we are just not able to detect it now. Um, these are the conversations we have with people on an individual basis where we look at the details of your family history, we look at the details of what testing may have happened, and then we can make uh, better uh, specific recommendations and help you understand your specific situation. Um, and here is a, a point where genetic testing is not always straightforward. Uh, usually it is in that the lab says to us, this gene or, or these genes are okay. We suspect that they work based on the genetic code we're looking at, or this gene looks to have a mutation in it, or there's some sort of an error in the genetic code, and we expect that this gene won't work properly based on the arrangement of letters in this gene. But occasionally, the lab comes back with a result, and they say to us, well, we see a switch in the genetic code. Usually, these are single letter switches in the genetic code, and we're not really sure whether or not it's a problem. We know there's normal variability between people and their DNA. All of our DNA is not identical. It's close, but it's not identical. There's normal variability between people. And here, I've just uh, made a representation that just like you can spell words differently, but they're both okay. You can spell theater at the end, T-E-R, or you can spell theater at the end, T-R-E, depending on what side of the Atlantic you live on. 
They're both acceptable spellings. We see that in genetic testing also, where you, there are alternative spellings of the same gene, um, and they're both okay. And because of this, though, sometimes the lab sees an alternative spelling and scratches their head and says, we don't know what the correct interpretation is here. And again, um, it's helpful to be tested by people who are expert in genetics because we can help sort out what to do um, in these situations. But basically, this means we don't know what's going on and typically we don't recommend testing anyone else until we figure this out. Um, people often share that it's difficult to, sh to talk about this information in the family and some of the reasons that are given are things like, I don't want to upset my relative. Well, you know, honestly, who wants to be the one to pick up the phone and say, guess what, there's cancer in the family or guess what, there's genetic risk for cancer in the family. It's, it's much happier to talk about someone's graduation or someone's accomplishment. It, you know, you can feel uh, reluctant to be the bearer of bad news. Or sometimes people say, you know, my relative is going through a lot right now. Um, I don't want to burden her or him with this information. Um, we would point out that sometimes even a relative who is going through a difficult diagnosis and treatment um, may still be very interested in, oops, in, uh, in engaging in the process of uh, providing information or even genetic testing because it allows that person to provide powerful, helpful information to others. And it may make them feel empowered just at the time when they're feeling so uh, not powerful and so beleaguered based on their, their own situation. So, you know, again, everyone needs to use their judgment and be sensitive in the way they discuss this. But just because a relative is going through a diagnosis doesn't mean that they can't benefit from getting this information too. And as a matter of fact, it may have direct bearing on their medical care. Um, Sometimes people are worried that their relative may not be supportive of it or even that their relative will be angry. And you know what? Sometimes you just don't know how it's going to go, but you have to try. And we honestly feel that in some cases there's a real moral imperative to try to help. You know, if at the end of the day your relative doesn't listen or they're angry, you, you can't help that. You did the right thing and you can feel good about that. Um, so pointers for communicating some of this type of information with your family um, is, again, you don't need to be this you know, scientific genetic expert and, and feel like you have to relay every nuance and detail. Just the basics are fine. You, it's fine to stay away from medical terminology. Some of you may be quite sophisticated in your own understanding of medical issues, but for your relatives, maybe they haven't been as much involved in the medical care system, and, and, and just some basic information is fine. Um, my second point is, uh, you know, how many of you enjoy it when your relatives call you and tell you what to do? <laughs> you know, anyone? <laughs> uh, you know, no one, right? So you're not responsible and it's not your role to do anything but share that this is going on. You don't need to be sorting out your relative's medical care. And you don't need to think that it's up to you to give advice about, you know, and now these are the things you need to do. You just need to make them aware, and again, what are resources that they can um, uh, go to, or even who's the type of person they can see if they are interested in following it up themselves. Uh, there's printed information some people find helpful. It's often best to communicate directly with your family member if it's at all possible. Although sometimes the way family dynamics work is there's a matriarch or there's someone who makes it their business to know everyone else's business and you might engage those people sometimes. Uh, you know your family and you know what might work and, and, and you need to do it that way. Uh, it's helpful to listen also as you're sharing what can be scary information and not just be spewing um, information and, and not stopping to hear uh, what your relative is saying back. It's a, it is important to listen. Oops, I keep going in the wrong order, sorry. Um, I think a lot of us, when we, we feel, all right, I, I'm ready, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna tell so-and-so about my cancer diagnosis. Um, we have it in our heads, this is gonna be the ideal way, uh, or we're gonna get together next week, maybe I should invite my relative to go out to lunch so I can share this information about my diagnosis or my genetic risk. And maybe that, you know, your life is busy and it's just not going to happen and, and it never happens because you can't do it in the ideal way that you've, you know, made uh, up in your head. While, of course, in person is always best, there are alternatives. And the fact that it, it, it happens is the most important thing. So if you can't do it on person, picking up the phone is okay. Uh, some people love email and they communicate extensively with their relatives with email. Uh, that's fine. 
Um, some, of the, uh, um, some of you may have embraced other social media, um, putting it out there, putting it on a web page. I know I'm on certain people's family web pages. I'm the genetic counselor to call if you have questions about our family diagnosis of this condition. Um, there are lots of ways to be creative about this. Even picking up a pen and writing an old-fashioned letter is the way some people like to do it. There's no one right or wrong way. The important thing is that it happens. Ugh, I'm, I'm not a fast learner here, am I? Okay. So, you know, in summary here, now, there are some things you can plan for and some things you can't. And some people, again, get trapped in this sort of fatalistic thing. Gosh, there's all this cancer in my family. Why, do, why am I even going to get into this? There's just, I, you know, it's just going to happen to me. There's nothing I can do. It's not true. There really are some things that you can plan for, even if you can't plan for every health event that might befall you. In the case of knowing about your family history of information, it can change your care. In the case of knowing about genetic risk for cancer, it can change care. And it makes sense to do the things you can, recognizing you can't change every risk factor, you can't change sometimes what may uh, happen, medically speaking, but it does make sense to try to focus and do the things that you can. And sharing information about your personal and family history can be life-saving. Um, it's fine to ask for help. Uh, we're here, uh, members of a, your medical team are here to help. There are supportive resources, there are support organizations, and, and you're not alone uh, in this. And that's, that's it, so thank you. Um, I was gonna say, one of the things I could touch on is the insurance question, because I know that's a question, uh, while everyone is coming up here. Um, Many people have concern about getting involved in family history assessment or genetic testing because they're worried that it may uh, mark their relative as someone at increased risk and make them uninsurable or it may make their rates go up. And that's something that all of us in the genetics community were very concerned about for a very long time. And fortunately, there are multiple pieces of legislation now that make that illegal. Um, the, the big one now that we have is called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It was passed in 2008. It's not new now. It's not part of the new health care reform that who knows what, what way the wind is blowing with that. Um, it was not contentious. It was passed with a lot of bipartisan support. What GINA says is that if you have a genetic risk identified or family history, um, you cannot be underwritten based on that information. So you can't be dropped, you can't see your rates go up, you can't be denied access to health insurance based on genetic information. It's federal legislation, it's every state. GINA also applies to employment situations. So you can't be denied a job, you can't be denied a, a promotion uh, based on genetic information. Thanks, Jill. So life insurance is a little bit of a different issue. Um, there is no legislation that prevents you from being underwritten for life insurance. Your risk of the genetic information coming up and being a factor in your underwriting really depends on the type of product that you get. Some people get their life insurance through their place of employment and it's through some sort of a group process. In that setting, if that's you, for example, at Penn, a lot of us get our life insurance that way. It doesn't matter what your genetic risk is. It's not used in the underwriting process. The bigger policy that you get, the more underwriting you're going to be exposed to. Um, that said, we, we did a survey a few years ago looking at life insurers' use of genetic testing information um, in, in their underwriting and Oddly enough, there are not many life insurers that were using that, at least a, f a few years ago. Um, that's not to say that no one uses it. Um, in our survey of, uh, uh, not, it wasn't in GI cancer, but it was in the uh, breast cancer world and BRC went to two carriers, uh, we found that among our, uh, our, our vast uh, a registry of people that we follow, that almost no one had problems getting the life insurance that they wanted, but some people had to shop around. The first place that they called was not necessarily offering them a product that they found acceptable. Um, so the life insurance community knows about genetic testing, and it, to, to some degree, it's a little puzzling why they're not using it more than they, they are. Um, but they're not always using it. It's not like, I'll, oh, I'll never get life insurance. Uh, for people who've had a cancer diagnosis in the past, unfortunately, that's your major issue for adverse underwriting, not the genetic testing um, that showed you why you were vulnerable. It's, it's having had the cancer diagnosis 
in the past, that could be a risk. Uh, so, uh, I mean, our advice is that you have to weigh always the benefit of the genetic information and what it's going to do for you, medically speaking, and, and your relatives, and, and so on. And we think that benefit can be fairly profound to weigh that against the theoretical risk that maybe one day I won't get the exact life insurance product that I want. Everyone has to you know, really weigh that out and then and make a decision. Thanks, Jill. There was a question posed uh, pertaining to the relationship between diverticulosis, diverticulitis, and colon cancer. And just to uh, uh, affirm that diverticulosis is a common condition that uh, occurs in uh, Americans. It's a result of, uh, of, of uh, dietary um, uh, uh, embracement of a relatively low fiber diet. It results in little outpouchings or pockets in the colon, and it has no relationship to individual patients' risk for colon cancer. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Yes. One more question. Um, is the Wolfram syndrome also done in other countries? Like, is there a bias around the world for these different syndromes, or are they all pretty much equal? Mel, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, work on genetic syndromes for cancer is, in fact, going on all over the world. And uh, it may be that certain gene changes, if you will, are more common in one part of the world versus another based on common shared genetic ancestry of that particular group. So it may be that there are some differences based on, on that, um, but there are certainly a lot of overlap. And, Fortunately, in the world of cancer genetics, there's a lot of collegiality and collaboration that's gone on, and it's made all of the uh, information uh, much more powerful and broadly applicable. And so it's really been nice to see how collaborative people have been in this field, especially since we're working with something that's uh, you know, less common, let's say, and, and it's important when people band together. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's time we must uh, conclude this session. Um, to my surprise and delight, there'll be a DJ coming in to set up at 11.30 for some music with lunch. And um, uh, uh, please uh, uh, note that there will be sessions focusing on uh, uh, issues pertaining to African Americans and Latinos, and that will take place in the Versailles Room. And I really want to thank uh, all of our participants today, particularly Steve Worth, John Tersey, uh, for um, uh, making this, I think, a successful program. I really want to thank you, uh, all you attendees. Uh, clearly, you bring a tremendous uh, 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 passion. Your personal stories are extraordinarily valuable for us. And no doubt, uh, they're valuable for you to share with your friends and your family. So go out there and uh, spread the good news. Thank you very much. Thank you.